Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone to the May 17, 2010 meeting of the Goffstown Board of Selectmen. If everyone please rise for the pledge. Mr. Fournier, would you please lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I just heard my cell phone off. I forgot about that. All right, our first order of business will be the uh, acceptance uh, with or without corrections of the meeting of uh, May 10th. Uh, I'd like a motion. So moved. Moved by Selectman Devans. Is there a second? Yes. Second, second by Selectman Pierce. Any corrections from anyone? Steve, make the meeting. Are we good? We good? Okay. All those in favor of accepting the minutes as written, say aye. 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 Five zero. Next, uh, any announcements? Just want to uh, have one. Uh, we had the Goffstown Business Expo on Saturday, and I just want to thank uh, uh, some key folks. Uh, we obviously our 250th committee was there, and they had helped plan it. Um, hopefully, I'm not going to be missing anyone. Uh, the Lions Club, and uh, specifically Marianne and Bruce McKenna, Jim Helene on our HDC, uh, Elizabeth Gabrul and. I know she put in a, a ton of work, um, Carol Huxel, the list kind of goes on and on. I also want to thank uh, the Goffstown School District because we were able to use the gym uh, at no cost and uh, certainly they provided custodial support. And to thank a lot of our town employees, they changed the reader board signs at the last minute for us uh, despite the fact that we had a lot of traffic and uh, road construction issues. I think overall um, it was a nice turnout, the weather was, mm -hmm. was fantastic which I think probably uh, maybe diminish the crowd somewhat but I think uh, I think it was a good idea hopefully it will happen again probably in a, in a month where it's not such nice weather so people have a reason to be indoors but uh, I know that a lot of the uh, business owners spoke to each other um, and uh, the other group that was there was uh, EDC we had uh, some town departments there uh, Derek was uh, man the booth and I know uh, Dan and Al DeRusso and others were were Dan Reedy were, were there to talk to business owners, Main Street. So I thought, I thought overall it was uh, it was very encouraging, and I think it, it'll be a good uh, kickoff point for us to do similar things in the future. So any other announcements? Not hearing any. Public comment. There is no one in the audience at this point, other than our DPW director, who will be up next. That's just, you just jinxed us. Good evening. Carl, you're here to talk about the compactor. Yes, I am, unfortunately. Um, a few weeks ago, the board uh, authorized us to go forward with um, putting together a bid for a six-yard compactor, a larger compactor than what we had originally planned on. Um, that analysis and recommendation was based on a quote that we had received from um, one of our vendors. Uh, as we developed the spec for that unit, um, we contacted the vendor trying to glean out of um, the spec sheet they'd given us what the important features to include in the bid were. During the discussion, it was realized by the vendor that he had misquoted us. The, um, the price he had given us was a misquote. Um, and that the unit was actually almost double the cost that he'd originally told us in the, in the estimate. So to confirm that, we went to several of the other vendors we've been working with and asked for quotes for the larger compactor, and sure enough, they all came out in the neighborhood of about anywhere from fifty-nine to $64,000. Um, talking to the, uh, all the vendors again, one, one thing that caught our eye was one of them has a unit that they're taking out in trade from, from a, another facility and they're going to recondition it. And it's a five and a half yard compactor, but it's a double piston compactor. So if you look side by side with the specs for the one that we were going to put out to bid, um, it's very, very similar as far as performance to what we were going to go out and look at. So they're telling us that they could get this 
installed for us for twenty thousand dollars as a reconditioned unit the warranty on a new unit would have been twelve months this reconditioned unit would come with a six month warranty so obviously we don't have quite the warranty um, but for that amount of money it was a, it's our feeling that um, this would probably be the the way to go given the budget constraints that we have to deal with this year and the, the where we're at so I wanted to come in and kind of revisit with the board and get your sense um, we could, when, when the problem first arose, Sue and I discussed it, and you know, our first kind of take on it was, well, let's put it out to bid and open it up to, uh, they can offer us a used unit if they'd like, you know, as an alternate to the bid, um, <coughs> so that we could kind of pick and choose and see all the options. The problem is these, because these used units are so much less expensive than a new one, they literally get snatched up as soon as they become available. So this guy's already got, since he talked to us, he's got two other people already asking him to, uh, if they can purchase this. And he's kind of holding it for us because he feels a little bad that he gave us the misquote on the new one. So I don't know what the board's pleasure is. We can do any of it any way you want to go, but this used unit is available. It does look like it would suit our needs. Um, the price for Miss Bender would be twenty thousand dollars as an additional. We have to drop three phase service into the building, so there'll be an additional cost from an electrician to do that to upgrade the panel into the building. But that would have been the case with any of these units we bought. So it's uh, that's that's not really a vendor cost. That's a an electrician's cost to get the panel upgraded. So I am just here to get a sense of what the board's wishes are. Any questions from the board? No, we'll start with you. Um, this one's slightly smaller than the, the five and a half yard, but right. it's a double, double ram piston. Well, that, that's what I was going to get to. The other ones were not a double ram, were they? No, it was the same. Now, on a double ram, do both pistons uh, operate at the same time, or does one no, they both work and then the other one's like it, a high piston? <coughs> what it does, instead of one piston in the center of the plate right. and then the weight on the plate right. twisting, there are two pistons that push, and it's okay. it packs better and it's a more stable unit for a wider base. You know, just one follow-up on it, but it seems to me that that would probably, hopefully, would put less wear and tear on the pistons or yeah. cylinders over time. You would, you would think. Okay. Carl, would you speak to uh, the requirement for different binding chains and hooks and what do you mean by that? What, what that is is when you, when you put a trailer against the wall, <coughs> and you're pushing with a compactor, you have to hold it to the wall. So we have our other compactor and all our trailers have a certain system of um, hooks and chains that we back the trailer into the loading dock, these fasten to the trailer, and it holds the trailer in place while everything's being compacted into it. So what they would do is match the system we already have in place at the transfer station and on our trailers to this new unit. So that's what that is. When the uh when the door opening is modified for this compactor, uh, that's where the chains and binders will be installed so they right. match the trailers we already Correct. have. Correct. And there was an additional cost for that too? Well, it's included in the 20. It, it says, it's, uh, I know what it says on here, but Thank he's, you. Thank you. yeah. Have you dealt with uh, this firm before for other matters? Yeah, as a matter of fact, they, they installed the one that we have at the transfer station and they've, up until a few years ago, have been servicing the one that we had, we we did find a vendor that was um, cheaper for service, so we've we've used a different vendor at times. But these guys have been involved since the transfer station was built. <coughs> Just a quick question, and I may have missed it in previous meetings. Where are we on the solid waste compactor? The pump. We we've gone to the other vendors to get quotes, um, so I think we're ready to order or go ahead they, they got it temporarily running on one cylinder or one I don't really understand the, how that pump works but there's there's multiple uh, phases to the pump or whatever um, so it's very very slow but it works um, so it's been operating in that condition since um, but they've got the new parts and we've gotten three quotes now it's it's almost a ten thousand dollar repair for what they're going to do to replace that. Because just in looking over the minutes, I remember that the comp, the 
recycling compactor was conditioned on getting the solid waste compactor done first. Right. So where, we're total, or where are we? Well, like I said, it's just shy. The quote that I think we'll go with for the repair, the best quote is just under $10,000, and that's not only replacing the pump, but it also is a service, changing all the fluids, new filters, which needed to be done anyway. So there's about 10000 for that repair of the transfer station uh, unit, and then this. And, and it would all be Atlantic if we, if we choose this. So they would do both. Any other questions? I have one. Um, in, I guess in layman's terms, we've got... It was, it was again mis misquoted, but it's about a sixty thousand dollar piece of equipment new, and yes. we're getting a reconditioned one for twenty. Right. I guess and so. I guess in in layman's terms, can you maybe give me an an example like with a car here? I mean, obviously we're not getting a new car, but we're getting a used car. Right. But we're going to spend twenty thousand dollars. We have a six month warranty, but what do we think is the anticipated life of this piece of equipment? You know, I know we you can never have a crystal ball, but what are we anticipating that it's going to be? Well, you know, what <laughs> I guess the best way to, to to tell you that is the one we have. Um, you know, they give them a year warranty. Um, we built the transfer station in 1993, and that is supposedly well beyond its useful life. These guys offered to buy if we ever did swap out the one at the transfer station to rebuy it because they they're planning on relining the whole box you know it would all be new steel um, one of the pistons is going to be replaced all the hoses replaced and they're going to repaint it so they said when it's dropped off at your site it'll look like a new compactor it'll you know for all intents and purposes it's as good as a new po compactor as far as they're concerned um, <coughs> I, I would expect to get 10 15 years minimum out of it because we're, we're even it's lighter it's a lighter duty load than what it would normally be using you know it's not in kind of sloppy solid waste it's dealing with fairly clean recyclables so I would I would expect it to last a long time how old is the unit I'm not sure it's from the town of Bartlett <coughs> and I, I don't know how old how long they've had it but they're actually downsizing they um, they had this five and a half yarder in the transfer station and it needed a new piston it needed repairs and when they looked at the repair bill they're actually buying a four yarder like what we were originally looking at for eighteen thousand dollars and I forget what their repair bill was gonna be, but they, they looked at it and said, Why should we spend, you know, twelve or thirteen thousand or whatever it was to repair this old one when we can get a brand new one with a new warranty for like eighteen and so that that's what they decided to do. But as far as Atlantic is concerned, it's a perfectly good compactor and would suit our needs. And how many yards this rebuilt one? Five and a half. And because I'm trying to get an idea of, like you say, you're, you're talking how they, they decided that, hey, they're going to go from the five to the four, and then this is a five and a half. What does a yard and a half mean to us with this compactor? More than the size of the hopper for us, it's the, <coughs> it's the size of the ram and the packing, the pressure that it can pack with. And there's a pretty big difference. The, back when we were first looking at the four to the six, I sent you guys the cut sheets on both. And you'll say, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but it's... There's quite a difference in the PSI of pressure. Yeah, let me rephrase my question for understandability. The, re the real, uh, my understanding was this packer was because we would get more weight into the truck, right. which would do the trips. Right. Okay. Now, I understand pressure. I understand two pistons, etc. But if it, if it's putting, I, I don't have no idea. But just say if they're both putting comparable amounts of pressure, yeah. Though one might perform better, it's still that amount of pressure and compacting. Is that is that would, would that be a fair? If they were the same, yes, okay. but there's a big right. difference. <coughs> and if we stayed with or with the one we have or, or if we went for a, a four yard or, or, or maybe we even decided to go five and went new, et cetera, right. in fact, that's the difference from four to five and a half is goes from is the price. That's, that's a, that's a mm. okay. Um, tell me what it would mean in tonnage in that truck. I don't know. So we don't know if it's going to pack much more or less is what I'm trying to get yeah. at. Yeah, we really, I mean, other because there, there's nobody else out there packing single streams. So we wouldn't know how much. So it's not like we can look at what other towns are doing and say this is what. Um, the demos that we did with our compactor, of course, it's a t the trash one's a 10 yard compactor, so there's a big difference. Uh, but we were, you know, we've got 24 tons on a trailer with 
the 10 yards won't back up. So we're guesstimating somewhere like 18 or 20 tons that we could probably get you versus the 10 or 11 now. The demo meant that you hooked up a uh, recyclable trailer to the solid waste compactor right. and made a special load of recyclables. That's right. We even took an old mattress and put it on the end of the backhoe like a big Q-tip swab and cleaned out the hopper before we did it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The existing <coughs> solid waste compactor, can you adjust the pressure? Uh, not easily. Like down underneath, the, when the mechanics come, there are load settings that they can adjust the pressure, but it's once it's calibrated and set, like our operators can't touch it. I, is the additional compacting force necessary when you're dealing with aluminum, glass, paper, um, it, with the four? Yarder really would that be able to compact it enough to double our load? What what their concern is is n normally like a four yard compactor is designed for like a roll off bar like our cardboard, the cardboard compactor. Um, so it's not a big can that it's pressing into. With our hundred yard trailers, the concern is that the trailer is so long and voluminous that it, it they they kind of refer to it as it's like you trying to push a stuff a cup with a pencil eraser. You know, you just push, 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 and you're not going to get any compaction. So out the of ram it. face is smaller? Yeah. Yeah, the ram face is smaller, and it doesn't have the pressure to push that long load in. One last question there. Sure. Would it, would it benefit us to go forward with the four-yard one and look into next year or whenever we decide to go get the one size that you would really like would it would it would it would be you follow around yeah I, I don't think so because it appears that they depreciate like crazy and the other thing is we have to modify the door of the building this thing gets hard installed you know, it's going to get lagged to the floor the door is going to have to be modified um, so I, I really think we it would be a real pain to modify it all for a four yarder knowing that we're going to go back and modify it again for something larger later I would just be interested in the uh, the age of the, the piece of equipment. I think it would make a difference if it's five years old versus ten years old versus fifteen years old. I know it's being reconditioned, but the frame, the you know, the, the meat and potatoes of the machine are still whatever age the unit is. Carl, uh, is the compactor exposed to the weather? No, it'll be inside the building. Okay, so we. We have a piece of equipment that's inside. So, I mean, the working components of what I know of hydraulic equipment, the working components in the hydraulic system in your valves and your pistons, that's what you have to worry about. I mean, the other stuff is pretty much. Was this used for solid waste before? Yes. So, it was used for solid waste. We're going to be using it for recyclables. And I think as Carl mentioned, one of the things that we're going to be compacting is going to be plastic. So the plastic, I mean, we're not we're not putting as much of a strain on it as um, solid waste. All right. <coughs> um, we have Selectman Camposano who is uh, wondering what the uh, age of it is. Does anybody else have any other questions? The urgency, though, we have is it's, it's, a, it's a piece of equipment that uh, is said to have been uh, highly sought after and uh, one week of <coughs> trying to find out the age um, could be lost. So I, um, I just texted that question hoping I would get an answer, but I haven't yet. <laughs> Mike Walton is the one that actually talked to the guy from Barclay. So. All right. Um, there's a couple things we can do at that point. Um, does the, anyone want to make a motion? Um, that's one. Or we could wait. <coughs> What's the board's pleasure? Oh, what magic number for age? Right. And then it would be a contingent vote. And then the other thing that hasn't come up yet is the, con the consequence. The con well, to me, the consequence is that if, if this is a desirable piece of equipment and it's then sold to another entity, then we do not have that. And now we start from scratch again. Mm -hmm. We would then have to either look for another reconditioned one or <coughs> go with a four yarder, which uh, we have been told is 
the, the specifications though probably won't be what we need. I have a question. How long is Carl going to be here? Just to oh, is this the only reason? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, we I, I, have, I have no problem going forward with this. I'll, I'll entertain a motion then. Well, we're going we're gonna to hold a second here. <laughs> <laughs> Hello there. We, we need a, the word so source. Oh, okay. So you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't know because Bartlett bought it used as well. <coughs> he can go over in Bartlett has a used piece of equipment and they're trading down rather than repair it. All right. What would the board like to do? No motion. Do you have a motion? Why not? Before we go to a motion, how much was the new one again? The new six yarder was about sixty thousand, depending on you know which model and features, but we got quotes here anywhere from fifty eight to sixty. When we authorized the purchase of the six-yard one that was approximately $34,000, uh, uh, together with the trailer, we were almost $12,000 over the various budget lines for the combined purchase. And you felt comfortable that uh, that $12,000 could be uh, covered by uh, savings in other lines. Um, Apparently, don't feel that about gathering uh, instead of a twelve thousand, uh, we making it yeah. almost thirty-five thousand. Well, we the savings we had thirty-four thousand, I think, budgeted for recycling and removal when we were paying for recycling, and so that's kind of the little money we have to play <coughs> with. By the way, we got our first revenue check from recycling today, sixteen hundred bucks. So we're now getting ten bucks a ton for this stuff, and we bring it to Charlestown. Does the um the board open to the idea of discussing going with the six ton. I'd like to discuss that. And trying to fi figure out what could be cut from the DPW budget in other areas. I think we should discuss it because I have a I should the short I understand the short term mm. Scenario that you're giving, and it makes sense when, every, when it, of course, when money's tight and budgets are tight, it makes a lot of sense. The other reality, though, is when we're, this is a piece of equipment that gets used day in, day out, you hope to go 15 or 20 years. I've, and now we're going from a used, from getting it used and reconditioned from it was used when the last people purchased it. And if I read in my under, listening to what you're saying, I feel we're purchasing a piece that's going to get us by. In other words, it's not what we were looking for. It's not, and when I even, you know, though I'm, I'm sure the company does a good job overhauling, uh, the last place has passed on it, and it's not even fitting the design of what we originally wanted. And the question then becomes, where do you find the money? Find the money? Well, then of course, approximately twenty-six thousand dollars, and we're taking on recycles from. June six. June six, and we so we can't afford to that. So let's 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 to put it too far to be down because the building fills not in a week. It fills what in a couple days. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, we have we have other. Well, I know, but it, <laughs> backup trucks and trailers. And All right, I want to try to move this thing along. Um, is there anyone else who shares that sentiment with Selectman Fournier? I do. I do as well. Is Carl, is there what can be cut in your budget somewhere else to make this work? Well, if you want to not limit it to um, the solid waste budget, <coughs> I hate to say it loudly, but the, the salt line that we, the winter we had gave us a benefit in the salt line so we're sitting very nice there 
course, we don't know what November and December will be, but typically November and December will put a dent. So I expect to have a considerable savings there in the highway side. <coughs> and we have about a $70,000 savings in our pavement uh, cost bid that came in. At 62, I think it was estimated yeah. at 68. Of course, but keep in mind that those, more yeah, those fluctuate. So it all depends what happens over the summer with oil prices. But for the early paving, we'd be able to be saving. All right. Any motions? Yes. Uh, a motion to uh, continue with our intent to purchase a six-yard compactor and to uh, increase cost will be uh, taken from other lines within DPW yet to be determined. Right. Is there, before I have a conversation, is there a second to that? I'll second it. Yes. If we don't have the compactor, can we still bring the recycling down to? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, it's, um, it takes a lot of juggling, but we, we can manage to do it. <coughs> I wouldn't want to do it all summer, but I And the follow-up to that, though, is that the addition, every time we do an additional trip, there's a manpower attached to it. There's the wear and tear on the trucks, there's the fuel. I mean, there's just so, you know, and then there's a... Pardon me, when you say manpower, are we hiring an additional person to, to do that trip? If, and the reason I say we're not hiring an additional person, but let's say if, if I can, if you have a driver, and he can, and he does four trips, and we can use it for other things within the, within the piece, or if it takes him an extra day or a time, then that's, then that's manpower. Be you use it during that full time or you have a utilization for them somewhere else. But if you add a trip, it's still man time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what machinery does. It buys man, man time. So what would we be looking at? I guess my question was that. Well, you hit the nail on the head. Every trip's a three mm -hmm. hour. How many? It's about three hours round trip. <coughs> yeah, we have a fuel cost involved each time we do this. Yeah. And how many additional trips would we be looking at a day, would you expect? Oh, it's not a, a day, it's a week. A uh, week? I think, well, the compactor was going to say it cut our trips in half, so you're looking at an additional two, two loads a week without the compactor. Selectman so Camposano, you were looking at a sheet like this in a few moments ago. That had the original return on our investment number if we went with a $34,000 compactor. What was that number? In red, six yard compactor, 34,000. What, which number, which right, area are you referring right to? Right here, where I'm pointing. Point. <laughs> you can't read it? No, no, on your <laughs> sheet. This is a revised Oh, it's a sheet. I'm sorry. <laughs> I misunderstood. Yes. I have a 1.8. Yes. Is that well, the number you're referring to? Yes. I, I put in that sheet, I this afternoon, I put $60,000 for an expenditure on a compactor, and the return on investment is. Uh, Three years, so we're going from 1.8 to three. I thought you were playing like a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> how does that I, I I try, how, how does that equation change if Manchester decides recycling isn't going to go forward or they're going to stop using us? This was a return on investment based on our own costs. So it's not including the revenue, right? Right. From Manchester. Hmm. All right, we have a motion um, on the table, and that is to proceed uh, with the revised cost uh, of the compactor. Um, and it's been seconded. Any other discussion? Yes, Selectman. I would please. prefer to go with the reconditioned one because the figures that we just discussed, if you plug in $20,000 uh, for the compactor versus the $60,000, you could still take $10,000 of that money and use $10,000 for repairs over the next five years and still be ahead. I got a little bit of a different piece of math a little bit. <laughs> and I don't have the exact figures and that's that's where my curiosity sits, I'll be honest with you. That I try to look at what labor per hour per person driving the vehicle. That that's all on those sheets there. I know, but I mean but when we start breaking down into if how many trips we would in other words, how many trips we would save with, with the six yard if we take so many trips so much fuel, multiply it by the week, by the month, does that make the cost of the value of, of the, of the, of the oh, uh, that's what the return on investment is. You, correct. 
but we don't have that number as far as how much we'd be saving for, for the difference of this reconditioned one and, and the six yard one. So that's what I'm trying to get at. I think you could reasonably extrapolate it. I mean, if you're using 60 versus 20, take the percentage and reduce the number. And I think oh. you can reasonably extrapolate it. Yes, well, that would be one year. <laughs> yes. If you're looking at a one year payback, that's what I'm saying. You could take $10,000, I mean, your repair for the for that one if you anticipated a higher repair because of the fact that it was reconditioned and you only have the six month warranty. So you figure you have no expenses for the first six months, your expenses are gonna be in the second six months. If you take the uh, possibility of having a major expense in the second in, in the second half of the first year, what's the percentage of that? You, know, you probably have maybe let's say you assume you have a ten percent chance that you're gonna have a a major breakdown on it. I mean, as you go further out, you every year you're going to increase your chances, but still, uh, I, uh, to me, you're ahead of the game. And you're only looking at a half yard difference. I mean, this one, the reconditioned one is it's got two pistons versus a single piston. I mean, okay, the other one is new. You have a six month more of a warranty. But is six month more worth of a warranty $40,000? The other point, God, I, 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 I just, I, I see, I'm seeing both sides of this, you know, with our uh, garbage truck and our fire engine, et cetera. If anything, maybe we want to just limp along with this compactor for a year. I mean, if we, even if it's for a year or two. <laughs> even if it's three years. Three. I mean, the payback is. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we do have, we have to keep in mind that if something risk. goes horribly wrong in some of our other pieces of equipment in the right. town, this is, this is a. I wouldn't say non-essential. It, it is essential, but in terms of the pecking order of all the equipment that we have in town, yeah. this is in the <coughs> bottom. This is not a health and safety. This issue. is not right. <coughs> right. But so I, I guess my point is, considering the other vehicles that we have to deal with, we have a dump truck, we have engine five. Well, that's, that's okay, the other vehicles right. that we have to deal with are, okay, are more important. Twenty thousand dollar piece of equipment. If we can get by for three years, we're ahead of the game because it's got a one year payback. We have a motion on the table that's been seconded. All those in favor of proceeding with the uh, replacement at a uh, full cost, which is in the neighborhood of $60,000, say aye. Aye. All those that are nay. 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 <coughs> that's a one four. Motion fails. Uh, another motion. I would make a motion that we go forward with the reconditioned contractor for approximately $20,000. Is there a second? I'll second it. We discuss this one to death unless anybody else wants another crack at it. All those in favor of uh, this motion to proceed with the reconditioned compactor say aye. 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 All those against? Aye. We're up four, one. Thank you very much, folks. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Let's bring up, uh, we'll skip here to the fire chief. And we have his esteemed colleague, Lieutenant Jesse. Come on up. You d you're just not here to be window dressing, correct? <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, actually, if you could speak to all this stuff, because we know that you're the you're the guru of all the equipment. So. I try to be. Yeah. Good evening. This is uh, Lieutenant uh, Jess Cook. He's the uh, one of my lieutenants that are full time. Also. Uh, I task him on the uh, <coughs> on the equipment, on the apparatus, to make sure um, that it's maintained properly, and um, we get a true read of exactly the conditions of our truck. Um, the, re the reason why I'm here tonight is is uh, to talk about both our engine one and engine five. Uh, the in the Warren article that that failed back in uh, March. Um, was to replace one of the engines. And initially, we're looking at replacement of engine one uh, because of, of rot 
uh, that, that was in the fire pump and the fire pump needed uh, some significant work. Um, engine one also uh, was, is, is experiencing uh, electrical problems. We have some motor leaks um, and suspension problems. So all, if you look at the truck, um, as it's parked outside, it's nice and shiny and red, but uh, it's what's underneath that, that truly ails it. Uh, so when the article failed, we needed to evaluate you know, what we needed to do to keep that piece of apparatus uh, functional for at least another year. And in the meantime, when we're trying to schedule um, this piece of apparatus for evaluation, uh, we began to experience problems with our Engine 5. Now, Engine 5 is a 1992 E1. It's 18 years old, um, almost 19. And it's of the similar generation of Engine 1, but a little bit older. So, uh, Lieutenant Cook uh, then found the, the vendor in Maine uh, that could give us a true evaluation of both pieces of apparatus um, and uh, they came highly recommended uh, by several departments in the area and uh, throughout uh, northern New England. So we said, well, we got to give it a shot uh, because what we're looking at was significant repairs for this apparatus or we being, were being told by certain vendors that these, these, these trucks truly need to be out of service until fixed. <coughs> So we so Jess took both of them up there, and he actually worked with the uh, with the uh, folks in Maine, um, hand in hand, going through the trucks, doing a true evaluation, uh, breakdown of, of the both the uh, mechanicals and the fire pump. So uh, looking at engine one uh, that went up first, is they were able to run through the test, and in, in, in Lieutenant, you can you can chime in anytime. Uh, they found that uh, with uh, with the replacement of many valves, uh, you know, we call it tank fill valves, discharge valves that you see on the pump, um, and certain certain areas of the pump panel itself, they felt that that would be a good temporary fix in order to keep it functional until the end of the year, until we had the opportunity to uh, try to get replacement again. So with that said, um, they estimate that the cost of those particular repairs would cost approximately two thousand dollars so in the grand scheme of things when we first were looking talking to some vendors for the complete replacement and rebuilt of plumbing in the worst case scenario um, this temporary fix is going to cost two thousand versus doing the complete overhaul for up to thirty thousand dollars in significant downtime now engine five went up the next day and lieutenant cook took it up there and I think by by noontime he gave me the phone call and said, we get some bad news. And uh, I says, uh, what are we talking about? Uh, they discovered a significant leak, in, leak or hole in the pump housing itself. Um, that's a failure. That's a failure of, of the pump itself. And um, in order for that to be functional as a fire apparatus, uh, you need to have a functional pump. Uh, what could happen is under pressure, that hole became, becomes bigger and bigger like a, like a crack in the, in the earth. And then you have a failure. And if you have a crew that's fighting a fighter fire relying on that, that pump, uh, that crew is going to be in trouble. So we have a fi they discovered a uh, cracked fire pump housing. Uh, the plumbing in it uh, is, is as bad as engine one, if not worse. In fact, I gave you a sample uh, several weeks ago. Uh, the motor has a leak also, similar to engine one. And uh, that too has some electrical problems. So with that said, uh, the folks from Maine uh, are recommending that obviously this truck cannot be used and it's out of service right now. And that uh, a complete, either you not fix it at all or you're looking at the complete plumbing and pump casing overhaul. And maybe Lieutenant, you could describe, it's got a, what we call a Godiver pump, which is, sim which is different from all the other pumps that are used in the area maybe you can go a little right bit. and what it was it was it was kind of a it was kind of like a when we bought the truck I was here um, the truck was uh, a demo um, it was they put these pumps in that weren't the quality of the casting was not up to where like the trucks are now it was a cheaper steel that they made the castings out of 
And this is like a manifold that actually sits on top of the casing of the pump, which actually distributes the water to each of the valves to put it out to the hoses. Obviously we have the hard water is what is eating away at that because it's sitting there all the time. You can't get all that water out. Um, that pump is special. I mean, they've been bought out by another company. They still manufacture the pump, but the older pumps, everybody's having problems with them. And in order to fix it, the whole pump has to come out and you basically have to rebuild this box, so to speak, with outlets coming off of it. Now they build them out of stainless steel just because the people that are rebuilding these won't, won't uh, cover it under warranty if you make it out of cast iron or black iron pipe. They, they just won't cover it. So they go with the stainless steel because of the hard water. It'll last a little while compared to the steel. So with that said, uh, in order to get this truck up to speed, you would talk twenty to thirty thousand dollars just in pump repair alone, and that doesn't address the motor leak, the electrical problems that we're we're constantly chasing with this particular truck. So that's talking with Lieutenant Cook and and trying to figure out our game plan. At the same time, we're we're developing our CIP for for this coming coming year, and it just doesn't make much sense to pour that kind of money into a truck that's at that it's an end of its lifespan at this point. So with with the recommendation of the board, what I'm looking at is is I'd like to move forward with um, the $2,000 uh, Band-Aid approach for engine one, knowing that that we still have some maintenance funds available if we still have to continue, continually do little repairs here and there on engine one just to keep that going through the end of the year. Now, engine five, uh, we would recommend that we don't put the $30,000 in because, again, the word I get from, from, from the mechanic is even after rebuilding this fire pump, there's no guarantees that it would meet certification. They were giving recommendations to downgrade the pump's capacity from uh, 1,200, 1,250 gallons per minute down to 1,000. Uh, just so they, they felt that that was safer in their comfort zone rebuilding this pump. Um, I wouldn't recommend that because we need we need higher capacities uh, with some of the fire flows that are required uh, on the fires that we have. So with that said, um, it, it's tough it's it's tough for me to sit there and recommend that we put any not a lot of money into this particular truck uh, in the CIP plan without. Um, letting the cat out of the bag um, and is I'm recommending that we replace both those trucks next year. Um, again, combining with the tanker um, to basically eliminate this aging segment of our fleet that is causing us heartache and causing us issues. Understandably, it's, it, it's, a, it's a significant amount of money, but um, these problems aren't going to go away even if we throw more money at it. So with that said, you know, again, we'll, we'll repair engine one with $2,000 to get us through the end of the year. We'll probably wind up um, continuously do the constant repairs on engine one, um, not repair engine five, but also look at, um, see if we can get a loaner engine as a backup. We're gonna be talking to some of our mutual aid partners to see if, uh, see if they have any reserve engines that could help us out, um, especially in the month of July, because uh, for example, engine six, our engine six, uh, it's a 2005 pump, uh, needs to go out of service for warranty paint repair. So that's gonna be out for three weeks. It's bad enough we have one engine out, out of service, but if we take two, we, we, we get a problem. For example, a week or so ago, we had a fire on uh, Pleasant Street, and we had to rely on immediate uh, call up of mutual aid uh, companies because if this fire became bigger than what it, what it really did, uh, we were going to need that extra pump in that particular case. Uh, so, with that said, that's where we're at. It's unfortunately it's not very good news, um, but again, it's you know it's 
it's a truck that's at, all these trucks are at their end of the lifespan and unfortunately we're, we're faced with that. And I want to thank uh, Lieutenant Cook for taking uh, some time and, and driving these trucks all the way to Maine uh, to get to get the job done and, and, and he was uh, able to work with these these people to actually uh, when the hood's up on it they were able to uh, point out exactly what was going on with this truck with both these trucks. Any questions? We'll go around the, the horn. Uh, Chief, the solid <laughs> engine one, um, is there any other thing that you have scheduled, repair work that you have scheduled for one? For engine one, I think, Lieutenant, you were talking yeah. a few other things you wanted to touch yeah, on. Yeah, we've got some, um, quite a few of the electrical problems are due to the corrosion, the aluminum. Back then when they were building aluminum bodies, they didn't count on having a reaction between two different metals. so. Now they've corrected those problems because they've learned from experience. Um, we need to get in there. I've had Mark Urella at DPW go through the electrical system, and we've eliminated some of them, but there's still some big issues that are kind of like phantom. So when they happen, I try to run it over to Mark. We see if we can find it. We might spend an hour or so. If we find it, we try to fix it or fix the ground and go from there. A lot of cases w with these particular units is exactly that. It's the ground. It becomes... It, it finds its own ground or it's lacking a ground. So it's a matter of just once you find a, an area, you, you create another ground or you try to fix that. Again, it's phantom and you, you think you've got it, but then a, a week or two later, a month later, it, it, it's, face, it's facing another problem. And how's the engine on it? Uh, they evaluated the motor. Engine one. Engine one. Engine one has uh, 87,000, no, is it 87 or 70, 74? 74, 74, 74, about 74,000 miles on it. Uh, we did an engine analysis um, probably about five years ago, and it, w it looked good. And then we had the Jake brake work done. Um, I don't. We haven't had an engine analysis actually to on the oil itself um, as of then. Um, it did go into McDivitt's for some work. Um, they did compression test on it, and they said the compression came back okay. All right. I guess the reason why I'm asking the question is because if we have the others out of service. <coughs> Other two, engine five and the other one out for its schedule. Is this the only one that we have that we have to depend on? I mean, that's why we're looking at a loaner because we really can't <coughs> depend on engine one. We still have we have what we call engine four, and which is the freight freight liner, right. and we'll have engine one. So there's our two that we have left in town. Again, <coughs> we really we def desperately need to have that third. We want to make sure we have a third in service. Right now, you know, for example, if we have an engine go down for just general maintenance, we're down. Uh, so that doesn't put us in a good spot. Thank you. On engine one and five, if I hear you correctly, you were estimating somewhere between thirty and forty thousand dollars to do a full all the s repairs you would you anticipated, either. It's about right, D but the, 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 again, so uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. If, uh, if you had $40,000, which engine would you repair? Mm. One or five? Well, it's, it's a trick question because <laughs> you have a, uh, mechanically, you have other issues that, that pop up. For example, you have on engine five, you have that specialized pump right. and you don't know if it's going to work. If you rebuild it, they may say, "Well, we can certify it to a thousand gallons per minute, thousand gallons per minute." So it's not really the truck you used to have, but it works. But on the other hand, you have some, something like Engine One. You could fix the plumbing in it and do some electrical upgrades, but the suspension is overburdened. So we're constantly going through brakes, and it doesn't stop very good. Um, so um, either way, you're really <coughs> not in a good position. Oh, I'll accept an Uber. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Do have any more? Follow-up question. Um, yeah. Um, engine 5, you bemoan the, the pump housing. Uh, are those engines functional feeding off of a hydrant, or is the pump part of that, too? The pump is part of that, too. Thank you. Yep. Chief, once engine one is done do you have an estimate of how long it would take to repair 
from injured one. Injured one for the Bowser Club. Team. Injured one will probably be maybe one to two days, um, depending on doing what the chief and I were looking at doing it in-house. Um, some of them can be replaced. They're right on top um, that we can do. Um, and the other ones, I think there's three on the bottom that are probably going to need some special tools. That way, if they run into piping that's rotten when they go to twist them off, if they break, they need a machine there so they can make that whatever length pipe it is, thread it on both ends and put it back together where we don't have that equipment. And engine six? You said a couple and weeks? Engine six is two to three weeks? Yeah, two to three weeks. Just has to go down to Massachusetts. Uh, the paint is peeling off the body, um, the compartments. Um, it's a pretty much a national recall for the company. Um, and they're going to replace the whole, they're going to paint the whole body of the truck. And so once those repairs are done, in lieu of you having an extra pump from a mutual aid uh, community, will the three pumps, engine one, engine four, and engine six, engine six, be distributed to the three stations? Most likely. We have that done yeah, pretty, pretty much, much right, right now. Yeah, pretty much done right now. Yeah, engine five is is out of service up at station 17. That's because it, it fits up there, and uh, we have engine four running out of 17 right now. Uh, are there plans to um, dispose of engine five and when? I mean, With why keep it there if it has no purpose? We can keep it there for eight months, but why? Again, um, that goes with the recommendation from you folks. Um, if it's if it's deemed that we're, we are not going to repair this. Um, we could dispose of it. Steve, you have any questions or comments? Yes. Um, so one is at 17. Is that, I just want to make sure I get this straight. Engine one's at engine one is currently at, at 18 here in, on Star Street. Okay. Yep. And engine five is at one. But I mean, is that, is, that, but is that 17? Is at 17, correct. And in place of engine five right now, uh, engine four is up there um, handling that area of town. And my next question is, what is the replacement cost for one of these apparatus? I'm not holding you to a number, just a ballpark. I, I've, been, I've been estimating or been talking to vendors, and they're saying if you budget $500,000 for, for a new, new pump, you're in, good, you're in the area. So you'd be looking to say a million dollars next year? Correct. Okay. And did you submit that to the IT chief? Correct. And all the vendors nowadays say, well, there's, there's more buying, buying power if you buy two at once. And I, they won't, sure. tell, me, they won't uh, tell me how much. Okay. <coughs> and I don't have CIP in front of me, and I realize things come up. But I, I know when we purchased the last one, I believe there was on CIP one other truck. But there wasn't there a large gap before we would even look at a third one? Right, right now, um, after if this, these apparatus will replace um, next year, we don't. We do not have to replace another apparatus until um, 2017. So we're up to six or seven years. Uh, that's all right. I just thought there was only that's, one. That doesn't include. I don't know. I didn't know that doesn't include uh, like ambulances or anything like that. Do you replace the two engines, or was this discussion about a tanker pumper or something? Yep. It's a combo. Yeah, because we have we have tanker five, which is kind of like the uh, the other so part of the equation. So one would be an engine, and one would be a tanker pumper. Right. Okay, that's yeah. what it was. Right. Yeah. What yeah, water, water, that isn't CIP. Water, water. Engine one is the one that was on the Warren article. The engine one is on the Warren article. Engine because five was the one that's planned to go with the other next one. Next year. And one vehicle well, replaced year, those two. Right. Right. And Without taking my thunder away from my CIP plan, but uh, my presentation coming up uh, later on this week. But the plan plan yeah. was for 2000, 2011 was to, is now to replace engine one with it with a another pumper and to combine the two both ta engine five and tanker five into a pumper tanker uh, reducing the fleet by one vehicle so, I, oh, go ahead i can wait um we were here with carl before and carl was able to find a you know reconditioned compactor are there any departments in the, in new england that have a, a piece of equipment that is old but yet can get us by for two or three years where with minimal with five ten fifteen twenty thousand dollars worth of work to, to, to limp us by mm -hmm. i'm just thinking that you know it's one thing to get one engine 
at a, at a half a million, but two engines at, at a million m might be something extremely challenging. And, and are, th are there any departments that are, that either have gotten Homeland, gr you know, whether they've gotten grants or that we could pick something up, put a little, you know, that could be destroyed? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like for example, in, in our in our case, we we had a grant for the, for the new tower ladder, which replaced two trucks. You had you had it replaced ladder six and ladder one. When we uh, sold ladder six at auction, uh, we had us have the the, the buyer um, sign off on a waiver saying that this truck will not see emergency service anymore. And when ladder one was traded in to the vendor, it's the vendor was. Uh, knew that they had to make significant upgrades to that truck before they resold it okay. to another fire department. So that's for Homeland Security grant. Yeah. But let's just say that a department is just purchasing a replacement <coughs> engine. Right. Are, they, are there used fire engines on the market that you can get to Lindsay you buy? Go ahead. Go ahead. With apparatus going 500,000 and up, and the budgets the way they are, most departments will utilize that piece of apparatus just like we do. until they have to get rid of it. Just like and we at are. At that point, anything you find out there used is going to require significant funds mm -hmm. to bring it back up to, to usable condition. And there's really nobody out there that actually takes a used fire truck and reconditions it and, and puts it back out for sale, like certifies it again? Right. Because that's almost impossible. Your cost effective is bring it up to today's safety standards right. in order to resell it. It's right, they have to go to resell uh, in a reconditioned status. They're going over. They're redoing the electrical. They're redoing safety safety components within the truck itself for firefighter safety, and the pump, the suspension, the whole the drive. Right, I mean, I want to. Yes, I'm just going to throw it out there. In December, people will be opening up a very large tax bill. I don't know if this is one of those items that's going to pass when you put it on a ballot. And, and I fact, I would highly doubt it, to tell you the truth. And so that, that's kind of like that catch-22 where you're saying, hey, mission critical, they're, they're warned, but the reality is I don't know if the town is, would be voting <coughs> in this process. So, I, and so sometimes I wonder about the repairs and what we should be doing here. In other words, to do a temporary repair or partial repair, and then next thing you know, we, 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 um, it, it goes out and the town votes on it. I, I just don't feel that strong that, that the town would say, hey, let's go past a million dollars in, in equipment, especially after what happened last year. Just a thought. I'm just, I mean, I'm just throwing it out. I mean, that's the thought process out there is that, you know, what if it doesn't, what if, you, what if we say, hey, this is the idea and we won't fix this one and we'll do a, a small temporary repair to this one, we could be in a worse situation after, you know, after, you know, next year. I was going to say, I think the, in, the immediate issue before us is getting engine one, one done. Repaired. That's a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think as the CIT process works its way forward, we'll look to see if, you know, maybe try to get two years of it out of engine one and just replace the tank or pump it. Who knows? But I think right now we need to get that pump repaired so we have. All right. Is there, a, let's, let's start engine. making some motions and move this thing along. Anyone? I'll make a motion that we authorize the uh, fire chief to expend uh, re funds to repair engine one. I, I don't want to say two thousand exactly. dollars because is there a second, second to that? Seconded by second. Selectman Devante in discussion. I, I just want one discussion. I, I mean, when we say that, I would like to think that we're doing uh, the, the the best, not not the best repairs, but the good the repairs that we need, not just touch up repairs. And that would be be it the suspension, the oil, the electrical. In other words, let's put it in operating condition. Not just the idea of a two thousand mm dollar. -hmm. Absolutely, that's one of the things where we always try to. In this particular case, we have a truck that that is at, at its end of its life, um, but on the other hand, we re we we need it um, to 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 do its job. And um, for example, just over a week ago, we had a fire. If it wasn't for that for that pump, um, the fire could have been very large and catastrophic um, on Pleasant Street. Um, but it's that truck that that put the first water on that fire. Uh, we need to make sure that truck can put that water on that fire, and we'll do that. All right. Any other discussion? Yes, ma'am. Just a quick question. Is there anything on Engine 5 that is salvageable, anything useful? Oof. Sorry. 
We'll have to, we'll have to investigate Versus that letting that. it just sit there for a year yeah, and then having things that are no longer. For example, we're kind of already taking some of the portable equipment off of it. Uh, you know, as other equipment breaks on other trucks, we were kind of I, robbing I, it, but. It's your motion, but I, I would just assume uh, take what's ever salvageable off of five and get rid of it now. Yeah. I mean, let's just not keep a piece of equipment sitting, you know, collecting dust. I mean, there's no need. We, we've already had that issue with some of it. I just assume we don't need to keep it. We separate the motion. Oh, thank you. We that's can separate. Yeah, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah. Okay. okay all those in all those in favor of uh, the motion, which is to uh, perform the necessary repairs for engine one. Um, can we put you saying necessary and proper repairs? Necessary okay. proper repairs. That's what that's what it was. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Anything with regard to respect to engine five? Just quick yes. question. Is there any conceivable trade-in value? I mean, is there any reason why you'd want to hang on to it until you've purchased another pump? I would. Uh, you know, I wish Carl was still here. I'd ask him what the uh, scrap price is for aluminum, because mm -hmm. <coughs> metals well, is pretty high right now. Let me ask you a question. I know it's probably far cry, but AFG grants are open until the 28th. I know we just got a brand new truck that reduces the age of our fleet, but does having this piece in the fleet, even though it's out of service, increase our odds of potentially getting what, a grant? What hurt us, because we, we got turned down for the AFG grant this past year for a pumper tanker. We were turned, around, turned down, and the reason why is for what they say is <coughs> they, <coughs> excuse me, they measure your need of your, in the overall scope of your fleet. So they look at a s the similar type and what's the newest in that similar type. So in our particular case, um, a similar type is engine six. So it's a 2005, so that kind of excluded us. Now if it was t 10 years old, because your newest piece is 10, 10 years old, they probably kept this in the running. But in this particular case, uh, engine six kind of booted us off um, the running. Um, that's the reason why we did so well with the ladder grant is because both of our ladders were, were quite old. So I don't think keeping it will help us or hurt us. I think what hurts us is engine six. I prefer to hang on to engine five because you never know what's going to happen. Something may come up with another piece of equipment, and we're going to have to put the money in engine five to get it back. That's that's where I was going to. I think we especially with engine one, the way engine one is, because engine one should have been replaced. Mm -hmm. We all know that. I could talk to also, I can reach out to some vendors to see if, um, looking down the road, if if purchasing and trading in um, maybe if would give us some money back or not, but uh, I need some feedback from them. So just so I have an understanding with that being said, if, in, if we would hang on to engine five, but it would not be used. Correct. Right. And we would store it where? At uh, Station 17. Okay. Which is uh, the east I south south station. Okay. It's there now. Where would it be stored once it's it for? Uh, right, right now, Tanker 5 is actually down here at Station 18. Uh, so we've moved a few vehicles around to accommodate that. What is the, what are the odds of us putting five <coughs> to commission I'm just curious I mean you're telling me scrap metal to me that sound that's that that's like we're putting well I was comparing it to what it would be worth to sell it right or okay. scrap okay. it would be like a trade-in value versus the trade-in value the trade-in value is I mean latter one they gave us how much work is that I mean, eight thousand dollars <coughs> I'm hearing both sides of this. I mean, uh, you know, keep it as a just in case. But then I'm, the other part of me is saying that just in case. Well, <laughs> are we going to put 50 grand into this thing with no guarantees it's going to pass a, a t an inspection? And I don't think I'm. Am I going to sit here six months from now or eight months from now with a vote that says, guys, do you want to put in 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars, and we have a 50/50 chance of this thing passing uh, a test? And I'm going to vote no. <laughs> so why new, keep it? How about a new pump? What would it cost to put a new <coughs> pump in? Didn't even look at that option. I think if you do that, do you have to now upgrade it to current NFPA standard? So that, I don't know if that creates another mm. issue in itself. But in the meantime, could you check into that? Sure. Mm -hmm. See what those costs I are? Can, I, I can evaluate that. Okay. Yeah. 
we're good. I still agree with hang on to it because we might be fixing it. That, it well, that could be an option on the table. I, under, too. I understand, but my point is, is that if yeah. in eight months from now we are in that position, are you going to vote? If if right now, eight months from now, I tell you that we are we are up the creek and we're going to spend fifty thousand dollars to fix this fire engine with a fifty percent chance that it that it may not work and it may not still pass inspection. We may have to put another fifty grand into it. Or a hundred percent chance 100. that the best they can do is bring it up to like a thousand ppm, which is not adequate. Right. So you so would you vote right now to put fifty thousand dollars into this thing, knowing that, and I would be voting no now, and I'd vote no eight months from now. So that being the case, I don't want to store something that's just taking up space and people have to jockey trucks around. <coughs> Doesn't make sense to me. I'd just soon get our money yeah, and move on. I understand what you're saying. But if we can replace the pump and do some other things, then that's a that's that's a bit. So I'd like to exhaust that option. Right. We'll look at that. And I don't think that should be our first line of thought because there's other issues with the pump. But right. if push comes to shove and there, you know, CIC shakes out, yeah. there's absolutely nothing we can do. You know, if we can get a, a year or two more out of the, the piece by replacing the pump, that may be what we have to do. Right. And one last question because I'm looking here at tanker five, which of course was supposed to be combined with engine five for the piece that you're speaking about. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it says that, that one's 250 gallons a minute. Correct. I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, we're saying a thousand is not acceptable, but yet we're running this other piece at 250. But I can that's, that's just, that's just, a, that's <laughs> tell just me that goes in the woods or something. I don't know. No, I think it was just, it was this, that truck was designed and in, in Lieutenant can tell me out on this was designed to transfer water to another pump who's fighting a fire. Tanks, holding tanks. Okay, that, oh yeah, that's, I hope that, that that's that, the okay. old, old way that we used to do it because you had the hose truck, you had the pumper truck, and all those trucks had to be at the scene. You wanted to lay the hose, and the other one was the intermediate. They say the older way. There are still locations in town. <laughs> it <laughs> is so, the way. So let no. me ask the well, to it. And, and I, I, and, I don't and, want to exhaust this, but this this is a foolish question but here. But all the three, all the all all three stations had that setup. Just, just, just the fullest question before, and I, I just, uh, just for future answer for my own personal. Yeah, I'm sorry, you're overruled by the chair. <laughs> if that's pumping 250 gallons per minute, and it's filling the other truck that's dumping it out at 1250, mm -hmm. how long does this well, last? I mean, uh, I mean, you <laughs> could do the math. I, 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 I'm, I'm looking at about after the first truck ran out, it's minutes that this well, thing is. What they depend on, Steve, is that you're there with the hose, and you get tired of holding on that hose, you gotta shut it off for a little while and move it to another part of the fire, and by the time you move it, it's caught up a little bit. Okay. We also rely on mutual aid. <laughs> and that's, hand pumpers. That's the initial piece so are you out there pumping, is that what you're saying? Okay. The other and, and that's why we're, we're specking out a new pumper tanker that has the adequate pump on it. Okay. okay. One last question. You got this opinion and just like people go for second opinions. I mean, so in your professional opinion from the person who oversees the our apparatus, mm -hmm. you concur with this, but. And I have consulted with uh, the gentleman that tests, he's been testing our pumps for the last 12 years. Okay, so um, now we have three people. We have yourself, the person who tests our pumps, and, 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 I, an, and someone else. Right, I wanted to go to someone that didn't have anything to do with the truck, okay. has never seen the truck. That's the reason we went to Maine. So he could do an evaluation on it and be impartial. Do they have a vested interest in by any chance in terms of do they sell equipment? No. Okay. No. And that was important to us to take a look at, fresh look at, no. um, from a new set of eyes, you know, what what our truck's really up to speed with. Okay. Seems pretty good. Thank you, gentlemen, Thank very you. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. It's a little beyond our... Uh, scheduled time for our public hearing. So with that, uh, I think Chief Sullivan, if you want to come on up. Public hearing for the fire? What? Well, it says also an emergency management, so I... That's what the employee is. Yeah. So, so we have a public... Okay. Can I start? Can I open it, or...? I'm going to open it. Is that right? Uh, I'm going to open our uh, public hearing. This is a public hearing to accept a $96,339,000 grant from the New Hampshire Department of Safety, Homeland Security, and Emergency Management for the Fire Department's communication upgrade. And um, we have uh, Fire Chief O'Brien as well as Police Chief Sullivan here. 
and, I, and you're both here simply because we have talked about this as a phase one and a phase two approach. So um, although we don't have anyone for the public here, for the benefit of the, the media, if you would just quickly just uh, elaborate uh, what, our, what our need is and what this grant will accomplish. Real quick, uh, folks have heard, heard me say this several times now, the, the communication system, both fire and police, um, have coverage issues within town. Um, and when we look at uh, how do we approach a solution t to our problems, uh, we, we basically looked at it and said, at each other and said, do you know anything about radios? And, and we said, well, not really, um, other than you know the day-to-day -day operations. So we consulted a uh, communications consultant out of, out of Gray, Maine, and they met with us and did assessment of, of the community and its layout and how we operate and determined that, yes, we have significant um, problems in coverage areas. And they also talked about um, our frequencies and how, uh, we're, how we're set up, um, dead spots occur and they gave recommendations on solutions. And one of the recommendations that uh, seemed to fit us well was we called the voter, repe voter repeater system. Mm -hmm. And where you have um, frequencies that uh, both transmit and then receive on a separate frequency and it's done at remote sites throughout the community. Um, when we first took the, the consultant around town, you know, it's one of those Revelations where they go, boy, we never knew Goffstown was so hilly, and we're like, yeah, that's our that's our problem, and so as radio frequencies travel, uh, they don't tend to like to go through trees, they don't tend to like to go through hills, um, and they bounce off other things and they get suppressed by other radio frequencies. So uh, they recommended the voter repeater system having remote sites strategically placed throughout town. And with that said, um, they, we worked with a vendor um, that was on the state bid list for, for Motorola and uh, worked out a price that they felt that uh, could get this system on its feet using four or five remote sites throughout the town. And realizing that both police and fire had similar problems, uh, we were gonna, we're gonna do them together. But when the price came, came, came together, uh, we said, maybe we better separate this thing because it was a, almost $200,000 for the entire um, for the entire project uh, for actually uh, $200,000 for fire and $200,000 for police so to budget it together would probably be prohibitive so we said okay let's separate <coughs> do phase one phase two and uh, because the police had some some logistical issues with uh, trunking that we decided that maybe we should do the fire first, get the infrastructure up and, up and running, and then we'll convert uh, police over in phase two. Uh, looking for, uh, we're always looking for grant opportunities to help pay for us, pay, pay for projects like this, is uh, we look to the S Department of Safe Homeland, uh, Safety and Homeland Security Emergency Management in the state of New Hampshire, and what they have is a uh, emergency management preparedness grant program, and uh, through this grant, uh, we, we applied and said, you know, this helps us manage emergencies, um, and we've got extensive history of emergencies here in town. Uh, that we felt the communication system was was their number one priority. Uh, they agreed, and through this grant pro process, uh, they, they agreed to fund um, the amount of 50% of of that phase one uh, project, which is the 96,339 that we yeah, you see see today. And uh, they also encouraged us to uh, apply for phase two um, just for funding, but they wouldn't guarantee anything, um, but they, they were looking forward to that application. All right. Uh, are there any questions from the board? Any questions? Yeah. All right. Just, just a quick one. Yeah. Chief, the, the matching funds have currently been appropriated in CIP? For, uh, yes, for certain. Questions from the public? Not hearing any. Then uh, we will close the public hearing uh, with respect to the $96,339,000 grant from the Department, New Hampshire Department of Safety, Homeland Security, and Emergency Management.
for the fire department communication update. I make a motion to authorize the to go forward with accepting the grant. Second. The project. We have a motion to accept the grant uh, by Selectman Devanza, seconded by Selectman Camposano. Any other discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Great. Thank you. And we hope to have the RFP um, in your hands the next week or two for, for approval. All right. Thank Great. you, Chief. Thank you. Next is our uh, town administrator's report. We have one. Oh, I'm sorry. The first of two for the yield. Oh, that's right. Right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah, let me just get. <coughs> I got it right here. Yeah. Yep. I was on. Uh, yeah, I got it right here. Second one. Yep. Okay, our second one. And this this will be the first of, of two. Yep. Next, next week. week. That's next week. Next week. Okay. Next morning. Next week, I'm advertising a public hearing, <laughs> and that will be to establish a yield sign, uh, yield right of ways on Cove Street and on Chattel Avenue, both on Lynchfield Park Road, in accordance with RSA 41 colon 14 B. The first of those hearings will be on uh, May 24th, and the second one will be on June 7th. We just tried to save some money in advertising. Okay. To put them in the same legal act. Okay. Moving on. Town Administrator's Report, Weekly Meeting Schedule. Yes, I just came tomorrow night. <coughs> That's at the police station. Yeah. It's a tour. It's, it's a tour. Right. Right. TV, okay. Right. Yep, and it's really that way. <coughs> and the Library Trustees at the Library. Parks and Rec Commission, Parks and Rec Center. Those two last two are on Wednesday. Thursday is the 250th Anniversary Subcommittee Fundraising and Publicity. That's here. And CIP at seven o'clock. Consensus is folded tonight includes a heat warrant, employee status reports, including the new hire uh, in the fire department for Colleen Keith down there from per diem, uh, resignation in the fire department, seasonal labor in DPW, and um, an engineering intern in DPW. Event permits include several um, library events. Make a splash with trucks at Cemetery Field on June 23rd. The summer program kickoff family picnic at Barnard Park on June 24th. The Skywatch at Cemetery Field on June 30th. And the Waterfront Party Finale. Um, two sessions with different age groups on July 29th. The Memorial Day Parade on May 31st. And Emily Stroll on June 5th. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve the consensus folder. Do I have a second? Seconded by Selectman Camposano. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Staff recommends and, and uh, recommends the intent of timber cut for Map Four, Lot Sixty One Three, Map Six, Lot Sixty One and Sixty Three One. So moved. So moved. Seconded by Selectman Pierce. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> we have reappointments to ADA Wayne Richardson and Richard Hoff, and Building Board of Appeals Wayne Richardson and Mark Collins. So moved. We have a second. Second. Uh, seconded by Selectman Pierce. All those in favor of the reappointment say aye. 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 Five zero. Enclosed can be a package of the RFP for the police and town hall roof and the clock tower repair and painting of, of the clock tower at town hall. Any questions regarding the RFPs? Pretty uh, specific, I thought. I don't know who did it, that's pretty well done. Um, motion we have to a motion approve. to approve. We have a second. Second. Seconded by Selectman Camposano. All those in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, this is usually the time we discuss whether or not the board wants to hold an all boards meeting, and if so, what format they would like to hold it. Steve, what do you think? <coughs> well, it's funny you should say <coughs> that. Um, <laughs> Uh, a couple favor, things. Are you in favor of holding the meeting? Yes, I am. Is, is that the consensus of the board, Nick? Do you feel the same thing? Hold the meeting? Depending on the format. Okay. Mm -hmm. Depending upon the format. Contingent upon the format. Do we want to address format? And let, let's talk about format. Also, when we talk about all, all boards, we spoke, and one of the takeaways during the last budget, budget season 
with regards to when people receive their tax bill, we also think that bill is encompassing of the town side and the school side, but in the end, they just look at it as one bill. We had talked about getting together with the school board, with the school board regarding what things they're looking at for next year. And we just sat here with our fire chief talking about a million dollars in fire trucks. Uh, recently in the paper, they were talking articles regarding uh, schools that they were receiving the more downward pressure from the state and receiving less. I think we need to be discussing what, what they're planning and thinking for next year and also what we might be going for. We're already almost halfway through the year and I think, um, I mean, instead of once again waiting till in the fall and discussing what, what, what uh, both groups are going to be looking at. In your favor, uh, you talk about format, though. You're not with yeah, I, I would like to see a discussion format where the boards are discussing. Not, um, not, a, not a presentation where they just. Exactly, right. um, which they had gotten to be a while ago where each board chair or whoever got up and just basically said, this is what we're doing this year and proceeded in that format. I would like to see a discussion between boards. I think one of the things that we also have to, along that line that Steve mentioned, uh, we have to um, also have a discussion from our side as where we are with revenue reductions again from the state because we have more of that and what we're going to be hit with just so that uh, other ones are, are aware of it. Okay, uh, when we talk about here's okay, so I think the consensus seems to be that we will proceed with an all boards meeting. It will not be a presentation style, but more a discussion. Um, facilitation um, again it can't be a free-for-all do we and do we want all every member of every board to attend the meeting or is it going to be chairs and vice chairs how do you want to proceed there uh, my preference would be the chairs and vice chairs uh, but I, I want to go back one step sure. and pick up uh, selectman Fournier's comments uh, are you are you suggesting we have two meetings, one with our department boards and our town committees and boards, and then a, a second one later in the summer with the school? I say we do it all at one shot. Well, yeah. Okay, I just want to clarify that. I think Typically we do invite the water district right. and the school district um, as so well uh, as our right. commission. Yeah, I would... Um, I personally would like to see the chairs and the vice chairs. I think uh, it might be too unwieldy if we had everyone there. It's a public meeting, which which means that anybody can attend. But I think if uh, those that are going to speak are going to be the chairs and the vice chairs. Don't come to with that if it's televised. That's fine. Yeah. Or whatever designee. Or designee, right? I, yeah. I mean, if the if the chair or vice chair is out of town, then there's another designee. That's fine. But I th I just don't think we can open it up to having you know everyone and I think um, I think our board should facilitate it with uh, a focus on what some of our goals are uh, we talk about you know increasing communication and I certainly think that selectman Fournier's point with regard to budget is an important one to have early in the process not not in uh, November or December and, and I think you know I, I, a fantastic takeaway just from this evening and I'm glad it all worked out uh, was we operated a little bit in a, in a silo tonight in the sense that we first had a discussion about a trash compactor, a uh, recycling compactor, and then on the heels of that we had, which I did not, you know, know because it wasn't in our materials, Correct. the extent of fire engines. So I would have, I mean, we, we, we luckily went down the right path, but in this, in, even in, in an environment in which we control, we, may, we might have made a decision that would not have been the best decision because we weren't communicating. And I think we did end up making the right decision, but the more that we can have these conversations with other boards, I think the better off we're gonna be. We might not always make the perfect decision, but we'll make at least a well-informed one. Um, time frames within the next, uh, when, do we, when is this usually done? Usually before school gets out, since our people are still around. And we'll do it at the, I would assume, the library, the information mm -hmm. center. Does the board want to do this on a on a, one of our regularly scheduled meetings? 
If we can, I would pre I would prefer. I'm just saying we there are times when we have lighter business than than normal, and maybe this becomes one of our regularly scheduled meetings because we have taken a week off here and there, but it wouldn't be a week off. We would still have. Uh, I'd, I'd be in favor of just having it on a Monday night, and maybe it's a night a Monday night that the school board maybe also meets, mm -hmm. so that you're killing. You know, they're already there. We're already kind of, kind of planned on being there, and depends on how long the meeting right. we have too. Right. David, you had something you wanted to add? I just wanted to pick up that that would always conflict with the school board unless they had an abbreviated agenda. Or, you know, they could hold a shortened meeting. Right. And well, I think Sue can have that discussion with the superintendent's office. And um, I do think that in preparation for this, um, I think we do want to talk about um, some of the items that you just mentioned. You know. We do go through that whole CIT process, but not every selectman and every single board member of every single committee goes through that. But are there any major expenditures that you are envisioning in, in the next, you know, next year, you know, or the year after in the short run? Um, are there any decreases in revenues, um, or and or increases in revenues? Any revenue changes, you know, that you're anticipating uh, in the next budgetary cycle? Uh, any staffing changes? Um, it's going to be more than not just a surface conversation. I mean, right. Looking at the increase that's coming this year, we need to be very cognitive of what <coughs> next budget season is because it cannot be followed up with a second year like we had this year. That's my opinion on that. I mean, we, you're going to start this process much earlier this year regarding not so much exactly what the expenditures are on, but what will be the total expenditure. Well, and the other thing, too, and, and again, I, I just think we have to try to operate, you know, together on this one but you know if we have to have a conversation something about fire apparatus or about a communication systems in conjunction with a land purchase in conjunction with a sewer upgrade or uh, you know <coughs> these are important because I don't know if the you know the, then the community has to has to make all these different choices every year um, which is fine that's that's how our that's how our political system works here but it would be nice if we can maybe sit down and maybe come to terms with saying, okay, this is a life safety issue and we need to do, you know, minimally one fire engine here. We cannot, this, we can't play around here. Um, maybe we can wait on a land purchase or maybe there's some other ways of doing things. I mean, had there been greater discussion, I'm not going to put you on the spot, Nick, but about this land purchase, the Roberts Farm, you know, had there been a little bit more greater dialogue between us and conservation, and they would have picked in some of the money from their fund, that may have had a chance of passing. Mm -hmm. It only lost by, was it 50 votes? I mean, it wasn't much. Um, and I think that's the type of dialogue that has to has to be present. Um, so Sue will work out the dates. We'll try to do it on a Monday this way. There's no, there's no automatically no conflicts for us. To assist you in facilitating this, do you want to ask the chairs of every board and committee what they would like to discuss? Yes. yes. Topics of yeah. discussion? Yes. And, you know, and as specific as we can get. I mean, we can all talk about generalities of like, oh, I'd really like to increase the tax base in Goffstown. It's only at, you know, 92%. You know, residential. It's 92 percent residential and 8 percent commercial industrial. It's like, well, great. Let's talk. How specifically are we going, you know, to do this? Um, and I know that it's a perennial argument um, about, say, discussions with planning. And I know Phil, you've had those discussions. But what is requested at planning may have an impact on our DPW operations for maintaining roads or um, policing neighborhoods. They all have an impact. So now that you mentioned that. One of the conversations, one of the things that came up, um, unless you want to discuss this on something else, I don't want to be taking care of that. No, I'll bring it up now. I mean. um, one of the things that was brought up at my TEQ meeting, Planning and Environmental Quality meeting that I had Friday, was that many boards of selectmen are requesting from planning boards not to have subdivisions with public roads because the community can't keep taking on the expense of the public road and they want the subdivisions to have private roads. I 
to be a discussion. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, like, I'm I'm just, just, yeah, I'm just saying. I'm, I mean, I was just. other things to do yeah. tonight. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm not no, bringing he, no, it he up. He was just saying that as a. As, as you know, <coughs> I, I, and uh, Sanderson, Paul Sanderson, uh, made a presentation, and that's when this came up, that a lot of them uh, are, and the uh, LGC is fielding a lot of requests, uh, you know, regarding that issue. So it's not just us that's under pressure. All right, and if there's any s any of the selectmen who want an item to be discussed, let, then this would be a good opportunity. What what time would this meeting occur? Would we meet prior? We could have a short business meeting just to approve. Right. Something that needs to be approved and then go over to the high school. Or maybe hold it. Or at hold it at the high school. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we'll move on then, if that's all right. Notice of award of EPA STAG grant, Sue? Yes, last Friday we received notice of the award of the STAG grant in town uh, must respond in 21 days. As you recall, this grant will provide up to $300,000 uh, to, and that's in a match. So it, the max is 55% towards the water hookup from the Lynchville Danish Park area. This, uh, so I had to notice the meeting. I had to get that in, everything in today's paper for a public hearing on May 24th at 6.30 um, so that we can assess and expend that grant. Right. My partner was working on the incorporating the conditions that were <coughs> in there um, to the big check. Okay, I just had a question just for sort of clear in my mind on this in case I get questioned on this. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is a grant that will provide up to $300,000 providing a 55% match for water hookup. So that means a resident would be required to pay 45%, the grant would pay 55%, and it's all gonna depend on the total amount of the cost of these hookups, because if they exceed a certain amount of money, then the homeowner could, I mean, you have to go into calculation, but beyond a certain amount, the the homeowner might have to pay more than 45% because Correct. there's only 300,000. Right. So there's only 200, and what says here, $294,800. We're talking about first come, first serve basis. So I don't know how long you want to open this up to. Do you want to have a first, a fixed time? I mean, we're going out to bid, and then they would, um, the contractor would give each individual homeowner. I, I, I think, the, in, in fairness, I think you have a window of opportunity in which you, you, you sign the dotted line saying that I am putting, I am applying for this. I understand that if I accept it, I, I'm going to be getting up to this, but it may be reduced if there is a high level of participation. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, if you miss the deadline, we then... We have a hundred households that have right. expressed an interest in hooking up. Okay. But now that is one thing of expressing interest. Now it's a situation where you have to pay. Mm -hmm. So I think now we're at the point of you have to either give a deposit or something to secure your funding. Mm -hmm. But the mechanics can certainly be worked out. I, I don't want to micromanage that, but I, I think we're at the point where you have to give them a window of opportunity. And, uh, and then after that, it would be first come, first serve after that time period is up. Being I live down there, should I take a seat over there, or is this just going to be a quick conversation? I think it's a quick conversation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, no actions so required. So, no actions required tonight. The public hearing will be held next Monday, at, at which time then we can, you know, be in the public, I guess. All right, next is the New Boston Dispatch Agreement. Following our meeting with the New Boston officials, there have been some follow-up conversations regarding our communication system upgrade for the police uh, phase two that was discussed earlier in 2011 and the IMC software proposal in 2012. New Boston officials would like to know if Gothtown would consider entering into an agreement at the same rate that was proposed by the town of Bow. For New Boston. For New Boston, yes. Yeah. Any discussion <coughs> here? Nick. Just a question. Do we know what the IMAC software proposal is? The cost? The cost. Um, the chief would have to answer that one. <laughs> With the data conversion for our system total, it's going to be about 150,000. It's been put into IMC for 2012. Um, CIP. Uh, what did I say? IMC. IMC. Yeah. <coughs> CIP, IMC, and the CIP. 
is the agreement with New Boston contingent on for us acknowledging that we will be going forward with the IMC we upgrade? Spoke, we spoke to them and I advised them in, during our discussions that we would be looking to go forward with IMC. But that it depends upon it but going through the whole budget. And process. they're aware that it's a whole budget process, PIP process, and that there's no guarantees attached to that. Any questions? Any a motion then? Just a comment. Uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll make a motion, but just a comment that I, I'm happy what happened through supply the no pie at all. So I'll make a motion to mm -hmm. um, go forward um, to enter into agreement with New Boston at the uh, proposed rate. All right. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Selectman Pierce. Any further discussion? No. Just a couple of questions. So the original co the original <coughs> lease was or agreement was forty thousand. No, thirty no, something. Thirty one or thirty two. Thirty one or thirty two. Thirty one or thirty two. Do you anticipate any personnel needs? In any the increased personnel needs? In no, I do not. Um, we've been going along. We've got our people in place, and by losing New Boston is not going to reduce our need for those people. No, I understand that. So that's uh, it's. I mean, if things were status quo, correct. would we be looking at additional? Any other questions? Not hearing any. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you. Mary Lou Lee. Uh, I spoke with the representatives of Mary Lou Preschool and Kindergarten last week. They, there appeared to be no major issues with the lease or occupancy. They are interested in a two-year lease. I informed them that I would be recommending an increase in their share of water from 25 to 50 percent, <coughs> like the other utilities in the same proration. And, um, and that we'd be looking at a moderate increase in rent. Um, so that's who we are. Uh, no numbers were given out, and I don't know how the board wants to proceed on that. What, when was the last time you had an increase with them? Hey, it's been the same for the past two years. And, uh, I think that if, th wouldn't this be a non public if we're talking about lease terms? Nope. We're negotiating with a no? No. No, no I checked with LGC. Okay. That how do we no. calculate the? The lease cost. How do we calculate the lease term? That's a good question. Isn't it a percentage of our expenses? The what they pay in rent and in their share of the utilities do pays for what we budget annually for cost at Grassland. So just make sure I get this clear. Then what is the heating cost then at Grassmere for the year? I didn't bring that information with me, but if you would like to see all that data over the past five years, I can bring that in. Because I'm looking, we can, as we're speaking, I'm looking here that their rent was somewhere around $4,300 plus they would pay 50% of heating costs. Is that mm -hmm. my understanding? Yes. Okay. They pay 50% of the oil consumption because the first floor is heated by oil. Right. And how do they we take up half of the first floor? And how do we, is the second floor heated? Okay. okay. And they take the whole first floor. Half of the first floor. Half the, the first other half floor. is the meeting room. So. And do we heat that? Do we do we heat that side also? Yes. yes. Okay. Right. I think I think the the primary you know issue here is they are um, you know a, a not for for profit right. uh, preschool, and that that's one component who has been around for 30, 40 years couple that with the fact that it's in a building that we own where I don't know if we're looking to quote unquote make money on it looking to you know cover expenses you balance that with what is the square foot price in golf town for a similarly if, it, if, if the town did not own it and is there a happy medium kind of in between in which you're we're recognizing that it is a nonprofit but yet we're covering costs and we're able to maybe not only cover our costs but maybe do a little incremental fix up to the building which I think would be fair. I just don't frankly know what that number is because I'm not a real estate person. And I don't know if this is a heavily subsidized number, we a don't moderately have, subsidized number. We or don't like have um, the expenses that the, uh, another building would have. Yeah. Well, we don't have property taxes as a town building. You know, I understand we have no that. Right, on I, the right. And, I, and I understand that. But by the same token, we also have huge expenses in terms of trying to make that an ADA compliant building. Mm -hmm the painting of the building, the landscaping of the building. We have town people who plow that facility. So 
So we do have costs, but mm -hmm. they're just, we just don't write a check for all those things. So I guess I don't know enough to, to proceed here. I'd have to trust okay. some others, but uh, like I said, I don't know if we're heavily subsidizing it, you know, moderately or lightly. And I, I think to some degree I'm okay with, with the subsidization of that because it is a nonprofit in business for 30, 40 years and it performs a function. But I don't think we should be giving it away either. So I think it has to be some sort of balance. So if I can, I, I guess um, there we are looking at an increase with on the water. Mm -hmm. On the water. Uh, I guess th there's two things. Number one, I don't want to wind up in the same situation that we wound up right, I hear you. with yeah. some of our yeah. other leases yeah. that we had. Um, I mean, things are tight. Things are tight for us. This does serve the community. People that this serves are also going through difficulties too. So, uh, you know, I'm right, sitting and here this, and, and this preschool is more of a co-op where people have to commit their time. Right, and I'm I'm sitting here, you know, thinking about this <coughs> discussion that we're having right now, uh, and I guess with the increase on the water uh, that they're aware of, uh, they're looking at a two-year lease. Um, I I don't have a problem with renewing the lease with the increase on the water. That's, that's where I'm coming from. I just don't know what the increase on the water is. Well, it, it's going to be an increase. They're going to be sharing at 50. No, no, I understand that. I don't know if that okay. increase is a $200 a year increase. Yeah. It's still an increase. And today, an increase is an increase. Would the board like further information? Yeah, I don't think this is. I, I don't think this is a huge rush. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then we can also discuss if you want if someone wants to sit down with Sue and discuss it. Okay, okay. but I mean, I, I think every, is everyone um, you know agreeable that we will talk about a more than just a one-year lease? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. it works better for them for their because they can they can plan for their tuition. Right, right, and uh, and also there's also like you know tenants, betterments, and improvements. I mean, if they want to go longer because we have up to five. Um, if I guess what I'm trying to say is we are now in a much different position right. than we have ever been because of the uh, the vote at town meeting. Now Mary Lou yeah. has the opportunity, if they so chose, if we were to even give a five year flat term, they can here, put an investment. They in can put an excellent investment into their property, which then ultimately is our property, which serves a benefit. You follow what I'm saying? But I, we've I never I had agree. that discussion. I agree. So. Okay. You, you, you follow I'm what I'm saying? I'm, I'm listening. Go ahead. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I'm just looking at they pay ninety dollars a week plus utilities. I, I, how, what, are, what are we talking about here? No, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that I mean, in the years past, we only had a one. Year I understand lease that. Lease. How do you how do you go into a five year lease with, when when you when looking at the increase is just going to be twenty five percent of a water bill, which I can't imagine what you know that's too much, and we're and, and we're saying that we're they're there on the idea of ninety dollars a week. I think that's the town doing something good here. I don't think you're going to be seeing um, okay. long-term lease with the but idea of out. dollar figures. That this. There, this, and this happens in the commercial real estate market all the time, where, where someone may go to the, the tenant and say, okay, we're going to keep your rent flat for the next five years. However, you as the tenant <coughs> have to upgrade the electrical or we're gonna, you are going to be responsible for redoing something in that building, which then is becomes it's the owner's building. So you're 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 essentially you're trading off increased rent for them doing improvements over the course of five years. So it goes hand in hand, and it goes sometimes the flip side when you charge more money with the guarantee to the tenant that you're going to give them new carpeting, upgraded this, et cetera, et cetera, and it gives them the assurance that they're paying a little bit more money, but they're getting a much better product. So um, I think we should look at it because now we have a much different angle to it. Than we've ever had. Next is uh, Barnard land purchase update. Right, the PNS agreement. Uh, um, just so you know, we have the survey has arrived. We have the survey. Carl has reviewed it. Things in line for him. And here's a selections copy if you'd like to see it. Um, and he's going to review it with the Barnards. And we can remember we did not have a requirement, but we had a right to do an environmental level one assessment. And if that showed anything to take us further. Um, the historical use of the property has been farming. Um, does the board wish to invest in a level one environmental study? What's the cost? Over 3000 
we ever had one done before? The library had one done in the time period that they got. And level one sh was clean, so they didn't take it to the next level. The next level can be shuffled. Who, if I can, um, what is the requirement of the person who does this level one assessment? I mean, do they have to be licensed? Yeah, no, they have certification. Okay. What does it entail? Are they yeah. checking for locations of underground storage tanks? I'm not what sure what's involved, um, except probably soil testing. I don't know if they do any. There's but there's, but there's never been any, I mean, I, I understand this when you're, if you were talking like the mill building or the one next door, I'm an probably industrial an industrial use, and I'm probably okay with that. But this has been like a farm. Well, this has farmland. Yeah. Hi historically, yeah. farms have been known to have well, farm I guess it, like no, or chicken farms. That's different, you know. But before landfills, certain were pesticides would leave arsenic in the yeah. land. So it, not that that would prevent you buying it, but it would be you'd be knowledgeable that it's there. So this is almost tantamount to a home inspection, I guess. That you're spending a little money on a home inspection and too make too sure that you don't have any diligent. hazards. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm. A what does the board want to do to proceed with it? A level one? A couple of thousand, you said? One or a two thousand? thousand. A few is a few is three or four. Three to four yeah. And when do we have to when do we have to decide that? Well you'd want to do that before closing. I mean closing schedule for I mean, July is there 1st. anything in do we have, did we agree on a deadline? Is it ten days? Does you know, do we have twenty days? For level one assessment? I don't know how much notice the contractor needs to do that. No, that was, I, I don't recall in the P&L that we had a window for this. Yeah, there was a window and before the closing date. Okay. What does the board wish to do? Um, in the past, on some of the properties, we've had somebody go out and do a preliminary inspection to see if there were any red flags. My recollection was to see if there was any reason why we needed to go further inspection. Do you recall? You're talking something different. You're talking about when you do um, considering tax deeding. Okay. Well, how do I put it this way? When you do, a, let's say, a purchase and sale on a home, like nowadays you have to sign off, like saying, okay, that there is no lead paint or this. I mean, wouldn't it be satisfactory for Mr. and Mrs. Barnard to sign off that, 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 they, that there was never any legal dumping or this, you know? I think if you do that, <coughs> and then, and then I'm just saying, and then current. from there, based upon, like a disclosure statement, and then from there, then maybe we do it, but if there's if they're if they're going to sign an affidavit, uh, not an affidavit, but if they're going to sign off saying that at no time did they illegally, you know. Actually, Attorney Drescher has suggested in lieu of a level one that yeah. we may want to get some kind of disclosure. Disclosure statement. statement. That's all. Right. Have, have there been any ever been any structures on our portion? I, not that I know of. And a lot of that. I mean, if you look at it, it's it's uh, Devrian Farms was farming renting, on it. Yeah. Was renting. It. I would be I'm, I'm, I'm I would fine with the disclosure. disclosure. Uh, I did see Mr. Barnard this past Sunday, and um, he said that he would love to give the board a tour. However, he is, has a little bit difficulty getting around. But he said any time that the board wishes to, um, you know, take a walk of the property, just you know, give him a call. You're more than he said. You're more than welcome to do that. No, can I just make one suggestion? If we're going to do it, perhaps we do it more than instead of having three people call we'll up. Do it all one time, right. Right. Coordinated right. through schools. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Through the chair. Yeah, I, I have no problem with the uh, disclosure. Disclosure. <coughs> of, uh, right. level one. Okay, but the consensus seems to be disclosure. Okay. Does, 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 does anyone on the board wish to walk the property prior to the purchase? And if so, Sue can set up a date um, with. Um, Actually, set up the date, and if I can make it, I'll okay. make it. Okay. Yep, same thing with me. Okay. Is there 
during the day, weekends. What's your preference? A nice Saturday morning store would work for me. Saturday morning? Yeah, it works. Okay. The other thing I wanted to tell you is um, Attorney Gresher also responded um, back regarding um, the Barnard's ability to take the difference between fair yeah. bar market value and what we purchased it for as a tax deduction, and he said that's fine as long as uh, the burden of what that difference is is on them getting a, an appraisal. I'm good. Is everybody okay with that? I'm good with that. Okay. Do you need a motion on that or no? No, nope, as long as good. everyone's good. Yep. Consensus is that everyone's fine with that? Mm -hmm. Go around. Yes, that's the consensus of the board. Thank you. Um, last week, the board of selectmen requested information on Glen Lake Beach. One, estimate the cost of a seasonal person to monitor the beach. K. <coughs> you have the assumptions if you did a 40 hour a week and an hourly rate of $10 an hour for three months um, and the only um, benefits would be the mandatory ones, FICA, Medicare, and workers' comp, unemployment. It's not really a 40 hour a week job. It's multiple, it's Saturdays, it's Sundays, it's Monday through Friday. I mean, it, it's every day of the week. That's my only, I think this is skewed a little bit because it's a, it's well a we two. Had to base well, I requested something. just 40 oh, hours okay. and then you can right. extrapolate yeah. it from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it came out to about $6,600 right. for, for a 40 hour. Yeah. Um, the second question was to estimate the cost and revenue from parking meter system. That's tough to do when you don't know what kind of parking meter system and I have updated ones in that because the lady who I was trying to resell last week, she was away at a co uh, convention <coughs> uh, from the city of Manchester, and her updated numbers are here. Um, she reports that the if you did individual parking meters, um, we sell refurbished ones that doesn't include installation for hundred dollars each, which would be fifteen hundred dollars because you have sixteen of the 18 parking spaces you can charge for because you don't charge for the handicap spot. If you did a brand new individual parking meter, really? you have 500 each. Why? Is there a reason for that? You don't she charge for a handicap spot? Really? Mm -hmm. That's what the brand new says to me. Didn't know that. So if you did a brand new individual parking meter, 16, that would be $8,000. Those pay and display dispensers that the city went yeah. to are eight thousand dollars that includes installation and signage and she does one for every eight parallel parking spaces so you would need two if you followed that formula <coughs> which would be sixteen thousand dollars plus there's a vendor cost of forty five dollars per month per meter for the um, pay and display dispensers then you have your collection costs and they hold uh, hundred and seventy five dollars worth of quarters she said so in the busy areas, they're picking up twice a week and collecting the canisters twice a week. <coughs> and it's different maintenance costs for the different sites. Revenue, depends how you do it. Do you do it per hour? Do you do it per day? Uh, of course, the other option was the one originally suggested by Collis, which is a parking sticker for the season. And you know, what do you anticipate for vacancy rate, you know, because it's not gonna be packed Monday through Friday. It's usually weekends where there's no parking. So you have the different scenarios there. All right. Third question was increase and strategically placed trash <coughs> receptacles. I think you have Carl's response to that one in an email. is if we're going to have a beach monitor, he would suggest to go back to carry and carry out with strict enforcement. If you're not going to have a beach monitor, I'd recommend more frequent collection of the trash cans. And the fourth question was find out the cost of lighting at the beach area. Now contractors tell us typically it's eight to ten thousand dollars, but um, public service emailed me today response 
and they gave all their assumptions of installing one new pole with one 250 watt floodlight and associated equipment, wire length not to exceed 150 feet in length, ledges not encountered when installing new pole, and traffic control provided by public service. Um, they estimated it cost 2400 Cost of lighting and the operating cost is typically $21.52 a month for lights. <coughs> Someone brought this up, and I, I was curious. Um, uh, what do you call it? The cameras, monitored cameras, mm -hmm. where that would be at like at the police station or something. Is that, that really wasn't talked about either because they serve as a deterrent for one, and secondly, if someone does commit, uh, let's say, whether it be alcohol or littering. Um, you know, someone might be seeing it on a, on a camera dispatch, so rather than doing an active, you know, patrol, mm -hmm. you're them just monitoring a screen. I, I don't know if that's worthwhile, not worthwhile. I don't know the, the, the cameras are pretty cheap, but you, know, you're, you, 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 would, you would know more than that than anyone. Presently, my dispatchers view, I believe it's 12 screens already. In addition to that, they're dispatching emergency calls, phone calls, windows, um, typing reports, et cetera to throw that burden on them, it's going to be ineffective to be monitoring that, for one. Number two, if I can't get an officer there, there's no way I'm going to be identifying these people by if they're leaving a beer bottle on the beach. I don't have a means to physically identify them and to arrest them, to give out a ticket. I need a physical identification. And, and, the, and the, the recorded camera wouldn't provide that? It will give me a picture of someone's face, but not knowing who they are does nothing for me. If they're long gone by the time. If they're gone by the time oh, we get that. the police, and, that, and that's that's my concern. I, uh, the reason why I mean not to be flip, but if somebody commits a robbery of a uh, gas station or some convenience store, and and their face is on the camera. I would think that's evidence that even though they left the scene and they got pulled over three days later, wouldn't that be sufficient evidence to say that they committed that crime as opposed to, so if somebody was, was drinking alcohol and you can clearly see them and that's them, um, and I, I don't know, then you can scan the parking lot for, for I don't know, that I know the technology exists and over the long term would that be cheaper? I don't, I don't know. When you have an armed robbery with someone pointing a gun or a knife yeah. at a store clerk, right. that's going to bump it up. That's why you see, you know, on the news, this is the person we're looking yeah. for. Anyone have any information? Well, obviously, it's a much more egregious but crime. But again, but that's what they're doing. They're trying to identify this picture. They have the picture. Right. They just need to put a name and an address, if possible, to the person in that picture. Without that link, right. there's nothing. But I, I also know that there are studies out there that show that cameras, just the mere presence of a camera or even a dummy camera um, is a deterrent many times. Because I people would agree with that. Um, so I don't, I don't, you know, a lot of people sometimes they, they don't know that it's being monitored or not monitored during any given time of the year and they just see it and it's like, ooh, I better be careful. So I, that, that was the only reason why I raised it and, and, and it's a lot, hell of a lot cheaper than, you know, than a patrol all the time. That's so I don't have all the answers. Our planner has attended a conference uh, in the past on crime prevention through landscape design. They've asked me to review his material from that conference to see if there are any measures we can take there to assist and to consult with the police chief on that. All right. So we know that we're going to do stepped up enforcement. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and that um, that will include mountain base as well. Right. So both areas are going to have stepped up enforcement. Notices have been posted, Correct. letting people know that you're put on notice that should you do any of these things and violate the ordinance, that you will suffer the, the, the consequences of those actions. So I believe they also state that if you pay <coughs> duty, be arrested. Subject to arrest. Subject to arrest, right. So th those are the consequences, fines and subject to arrest. So I, I would hope that you know, some of the problems that we've been having, having with the complaints of littering alcohol, animals, et cetera, will be addressed in the short term with just stepped up enforcement. And I think prior doing, in my opinion, doing anything else other than what, seeing how the enforcement goes might be premature. Um, give that a shot first. If I may, yeah. I, I have a couple of things. I, I, I look back over 
the first proposal that came from a resident who brought in a proposal and, and some of the issues that were presented. And frankly, that was some of my surprise last week is how <clears throat> I'm looking at the waterfront at Glen Lake proposal. Um, and it talked about littering being the biggest problem. And then it talked about alcohol being the next biggest problem or a big problem not only by beachgoers, but also by visiting boaters. So I was puzzled by how it got to access. And all, all of a sudden it became access. Um, but we were gonna allow boaters free access. Whereas in this proposal, it states that alcohol use is problematic among boaters. So I look at the parking meters, the everything in this proposal, and then I look at Mountain Base Pond. And when you drive up to Mountain Base Pond, there's a very large sign that says, residents only. Yet, Same this weekend I went there and there were empty beer bottles, Spanish people. trash. So I would assume either Goffstown residents are doing the same thing that Manchester residents do, or enforcement is an issue. So in looking, all of at looking at all of this, I went back to the original proposal, and then I also looked at the actual ordinance. And there were certain things that were proposed that were never followed through on, or at least never passed. Um, one being stickers. And I know we talk about using the stickers for um, residents only. Um, but again, I don't think keeping it to residents only is going to solve all of these issues that we talked about. Stickers, on the other hand, may not solve the infraction, but it provides revenue for the remedy. The remedy being the hiring of a beach person, someone or some people, seasonally to be able to monitor, change the trash, um, give them a radio so that if there's illegally parked vehicles or alcohol, they don't have to intervene, but they can call and have enforcement come. The original proposal said, at least presented, no dogs. That didn't show up in the final ordinance. Well, maybe that needs to be looked at because of some of the complaints we've heard, dogs were an issue. And the very arguments that were held back then. Two dogs there today at 3 o'clock. And some of the arguments that we had or some of the complaints from residents are people will come, they tie their dog up to a tree or to two trees, and the beach isn't very large. So it's very difficult to get by a dog that is tied to a tree and running freely. So I, I looked at some. The problem I find with our stickers, the um, the landfill stickers are that depending on where they're located on the windshield, you may or may not be able to see them as you're driving by. And I think one of the things, if we were to, there are two, two separate copies. One of the things we would want to do is enable the police department to be able to drive past the area and from their cruiser look at the vehicle and very clearly be able to determine does this person belong here? Is it a permitted vehicle? And my proposal, and I'll, I'll put it all together for you, would be that we go to a permit-only parking at both Mountain Base Road, Mountain Base Pond, and Glen Lake. The, these are just examples. 150 of these stickers is about $165. You can customize them. One would be for Goffstown residents. And the reason Goffstown residents would get one is simply the dump stickers are, are small. You may or may not see them. This is very clear. This is the actual size, the smaller one. This was placed in the side window or in uh, the rear window or the front window, the windshield. On the driver's side, police department could see these as they drive by. Beach person could, a patrol person, could also very clearly see these. The other ones, these are for non-residents. We could change this color every year, charge $60 a permit. It is not going to solve the infraction, although it may, because if someone's paying for a, a, a permit, 
and they're getting directions and they're getting instructions and all of the things that go with the beach, maybe they'll take a little effort and not leave trash. But if they don't, we are starting to generate funding to pay for an individual at the beach. Now, you look at the 40-hour work week at roughly $6,642, I think that may be sufficient. And I would propose two 20-hour individuals. Four hours, five days, overlap, so you have two individuals on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And one individual on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And their job is to be there. You can determine the hours on those four days, or five days, three days, excuse me, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You stagger them apart. They don't have to start at 5 in the morning, and they don't have to go till 10. But they can be there during the busy periods, and they would frequent both Glen Lake Beach, make a trip up to Mountain Base. If there was any infractions, they could use their radio, call the police department. I know you put a cell phone in here, but if, if radio tr transmissions are clear, I would feel more comfortable having somebody by radio versus trying to get on a cell phone and calling a number. That's just my own preference. And, uh, but my proposal would be that we go to a sticker system as the original proposal requested for non-residents, we would charge for non-residents, both Glen Lake and Mountain Base Pond would become permit-only parking. We would um, amend the ordinance to uh, exclude dogs. Look at hiring two part-time individuals for the three months and then reserve looking at the other proposals that the original Glen Lake proposal had, which was a speed reduction, hold off on that, and also the lighting in the evening. Yes, Chief. May I? That sounds great. The problem is right now, Glen Lake School, the kindergarten, is wide open. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take the school board to be on board with this as well. Absolutely. To, to retract, restrict the parking in the school. Additionally, at Mountain Base Pond, that parking is often used for people accessing the trail going up the mountain. So we'd be, be restricting access and parking points to the trailheads as well. Well, you say restricting. They could buy a permit if they're permit. a non-resident or get one for free if they are a resident. I know part of the other conversation with this is snowmobiling in the winter at Glen Lake. Would you have permitted parking? And we plow that parking lot all winter long. For what reason? Because snowmobilers park there at times and they access the trails. Well, they would purchase a permit because it's permitted parking. It doesn't exclude anyone. It just provides a revenue stream for us to maintain those areas. Any comments from the board? <coughs> I would prefer to go with the chief's plan and uh, stick with the enforcement, but now we'll see how that goes. Any other comments? Yes, Chief. When I was in the minority the last time, uh, if it's in the right direction, but I think it complicates it still on the part of the town beach. I think, it's, I think it's just one of those pieces where we're beginning to be mailing out this big tax bill, but yet we can't provide access to our lakes. And people will talk about economic development, can't rent the car seats, whatever. It should just be a town beach. It's a clean parking space. It's, it's really simple. I think we complicate some of those things. But at least it's going towards some place if we don't have the other, if we don't make it a town beach. You know, I this is, uh, I think this is becomes a heated issue simply because I don't think anybody really fully understands what the desires are of those, uh, of, of what the end result is. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of mixed messages. I'm hearing it's an enforcement issue to make sure that the place remains clean, free of alcohol, perhaps dogs, so that people can enjoy it. I hear things about access. Goffstown residents pay the freight. They should be the only ones to use it. 
I hear the opposite. I hear it termed welfare beach, which, can, which denotes that, oh, these are people who are poor, have no place to go, which I find kind of offensive, personally. Um, I go to uh, other parks in, in New Hampshire, and does, I don't think I'm a welfare person simply because I use Livingston Park or Clough or other places. I mean, uh, to me, that is just outrageous, to, uh, that the fact that, you know, simply because residents from another community who may have little less financial means come to enjoy themselves, and maybe there's a few rotten apples who leave their diapers or beer bottles, who, who, but, the, but to denigrate it to the sense that these people are less than, than human or worthy or welfare recipients is, is just... That's just wrong. Um, is there a problem with probably a few rotten apples who are making a scene for the vast majority of people who, uh, who have every right to use that beach? Yeah. But is it anything different than anywhere else? And then we're going to throw money at it. We're going to hire monitors and all this other stuff. Whereas other communities, residents, there's plenty of residents who walk by. They can quickly call up a cell phone and call the police department and say, hey, we've got some issues down here. They can also have a cleanup themselves where they clean up the beach. Um, we have a cleanups along highways where businesses do it. I haven't heard anybody talk about the fact that you could hire a business down there that has some canoes or some paddle boats where they, just the mere presence of having a business down there who can rent out like an outfitter that has three or four canoes. Well, what a great summer job, you know? I'll rent these things out. I'm going to be there the entire day anyway. And just the mere fact that there's somebody there who's in an official capacity, albeit a business owner, maybe that would, you know, deter some things. But um, I don't know why the issues are. I don't know if it is access. I don't know if it's a if it's a status thing. If it's a you know a resident versus non-resident, someone from Manchester who doesn't belong in Gottstown. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's enforcement. And we, and we get letters from people that essentially say the same thing. Some people say, you know. Uh, parks are open for everyone. Then I get what should just be for us. Uh, then it's, you know, I don't want these folks who are uh, welfare recipients coming to our town and using, clogging up our beach. Well, th those are all, and then, and then what? We're going to say the same thing about the rail trail? Oh, I don't want, when that bridge gets built and it connects Manchester to Gosstown, are we going to say the same thing? I don't want those folks from Manchester coming in. Do the people in New Boston say the same thing? I don't want those folks from Gosstown coming into our pristine, beautiful New Boston. We're better than they are. I don't know. That's a class system. I, I personally don't like that, but I'm only one here. But I don't know. So I don't know what the issues are. Short term, I think that the chief has the, is going in the right direction. Let's ramp up the enforcement and let's <coughs> see where that goes. If that doesn't work, then I'd be more than happy to entertain Nick's idea or even Steve's idea going down the road. But I think you start off with the baby steps. permit system provides access. It doesn't exclude a resident versus a non-resident. But what it does is it recognizes the fact that in order to keep Glen Lake and Mountain Bay Pond up, it's a fact of life just because of its increased use, we need to develop a revenue stream to pay for that. And this does that. I'm not in favor of charging Gosstown residents because they already pay for that in their taxes. And it's not unusual for communities to charge for a permit to go to a beach. We're not closing it off to anyone. We're not saying we don't want your community or your town. But then or where's your that going to go, Nick? Is that are we going to do the same thing to rail to trails? Because once that bridge gets <coughs> built, people are going to be biking into Manchester. They may drop their their soda bottle, or they may be drinking uh, an alcoholic no, beverage. If, if and I then may, where does it Steve, go from I there, mean, uh, Mr. Chairman? Where it goes is. When someone comes up with a great idea, we need rail to trails. Well, somebody also needs to come up with, how are we going to maintain these things? Glen Lake was developed, and I'm sure some conversation someone said, who's going to maintain the beach? Well, we're not going to worry about it right now. Well, the time is now. We need to maintain the beach. And your thinking is great. We obviously can't put a toll on that bridge for rail to trails. But somebody better start thinking now, five years from now, when that trail is developed, who's going to maintain it? Who's going to pick up trash? Who's going to clean it? Because those issues are going to come up. So all I'm saying, I'm looking at one problem. I'm not looking at rail to trails. I'm looking at a problem that we can solve simply by adopting what the original proposers put in place, a revenue stream to be able to maintain the areas. That's it. 
Um, and we talk about enforcement. I, I have an email here, and, and this may have been a while ago from a resident up in Mountain Base Pond. And there was a party, not a party, but there was the beach was packed, parking was down the street. She called PD. She was sitting on the beach. And when the officer arrived, he came out on the beach and shouted, hey, you're all from Gopstown, right? Well, she had been sitting among a group of people that were just claiming, you know, explaining how their town doesn't have anything like this. The response was unanimous, even from those previously identifying another hometown. The officer then clarified, some cranky resident called, so I had to come down here and bother you nice people. Now, this may have been 10 years ago, may have been 15 years ago. It may be embellished, but I, the, the point is, it's difficult for a police officer to walk onto a beach and start asking for IDs. Uh, if I, I disagree strongly with that. I've done that my entire career up until the point I was lieutenant. Um, it is not unusual for our officers to walk on a beach, ask for IDs, and follow the person back if they don't have it to their car. Where do you live? Okay. I and that includes getting identification for a summons for alcohol violation or anything else. Um, I can't count the number of marijuana arrests I've had down on Glen Lake Beach or Mountain Base Pond just by getting out and walking. So I'm saying routinely it's difficult for you to do that. It's difficult to have parking enforcement routinely with all the other things you have to do. Well, you can do. still get a permit, but you can then still drink, you know, or do illicit activity because you have a permit. My so. point is none of these solutions are going to solve the infraction. Mm -hmm. We can minimize the infraction, and we can provide a revenue stream to clean up the beach and maintain it and to have a physical presence. Most people will not drink alcohol if there's someone there from the town. They may do it when they're gone, but you would minimize the amount of time these infractions occur. Yes, please. I just want to say, I, I sometimes we complicate issues. And don't, bringing rails to trails in does not, does, does not speak to Glen Lake. And I, so I, I just want to make sure we don't go down that road. Because with Glen Lake, it's 18 parking spaces. That's a finite, that's a number, that, that's it. Once it's done, it's done. I, I agree with Nick, once, once the trail opens up, and I, I'm sure the chief will be down here eventually saying, how do we enforce it, how do we monitor it? But that's a separate issue, not for today. But, the, but Glen Lake is about 18 parking spaces. 18,000 people, I'll even break it down into a family of four goes in the car and then we'll say it's a fully loaded car. That means, if, you know, roughly, we're now looking at 18 parking spaces for 4,500 families in our town. That's the bottom line. That is bottom line. I agree with the, that you know, the, the, with the monitoring process and cleaning up and et cetera, but it still doesn't allow people in town to access to that lake. Second, if you were to ask a majority of the people every time, and you, I, well, you know, every time I see anyone from Goss, I'll ask, what do you think? Do you feel you have access to the lake? It is not, there, the answer is going to be most, most majority of the time, no. It, it's not, it is full, it is packed. That's why prior boards put up the rails. The, the guardrails, et cetera, which, you know, to condense and to minimize that amount. We don't have access to it, and it's been there for decades. And it's funny, because I, I look at it, it's one of these simple problems that, it, 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 that it's, you can't change the amount of parking spaces, so then you have to look at how do you grant that yeah. access. And I think we complicate this stuff too much these times. And I think this is one of those times where if you were to ask the full will of the town, I would expect a strong majority of them would say, hey, I think the town beach is a great idea. I would like to have better access to, to, to a place that I pay taxes on. And I think it's, I, right. think, and, and I, I think it's, let me just finish in like five seconds. I think it's one of these times to, uh, as a board, we should just look at it and say, let's go with the will of the people of the town and not just look for, uh, look for you know, talk about other, what I, what I call, filter out the noise, I look at other issues, just keep right to the issue. Just access to that beach. Oh, if, I mean, if that's the case, then if I'm looking at, I don't know what the will of the town is, to be honest with you. We've gotten some emails and some letters all over the board. We've got some people like Mr. Karen who live in the area who are disturbed by the fact that he doesn't, you know, he's seen people drink alcohol, drop dirty diapers, and it, and it affects his quality of life. That's reasonable. I got another lady, Diane McCarthy, who says, great, you do it there. What are you going to do on Mountain Base? Then I have another person who's, who, who wrote in saying, you know what? Um, I don't think that, I think parks are, are open for everyone and, th and that you should not shut them down and have exclusivity. Then you have somebody else who says that I think that you should let residents of Goffstown park at the Glen Lake School by permit or whatever and then have, er have the other spaces open first come first serve. 
I've heard, that's all of them. We've heard access issues, we've heard paying for it issues, we've heard all of it. And ultimately, whether this board, I mean, this is a tough decision, but the way our form of government works, if somebody is so passionate, and they can put a petition article on, we can, we can make it a private beach, but then it will be the will of the voters. Mm -hmm. And if that's what they want to do, then that's what they want to do. I mean, these, we are elected officials. We have different opinions on this one. And, but the beauty of our government is, is that if the will of the people, and then let's say it happens next March, says, you know, we want to make this private, then, then we, have to, we have to dictate those terms. But right now, if the key issue is, and again, it seems to me, even in that document, Nick, way, way back when it was started, and the current issues now, it's about people littering, um, dogs, uh, diapers, and it's, it's an enforcement thing. It's an enforcement. I think we, ha we owe it to the chief to try to, uh, to, to uh, up, you know, uh, up the enforcement, to see what impact that can have. And then if that does not work, then we should look at other measures, but give that, give that a shot first. I uh, appreciate the effort uh, Select and Capistano made to, to bring these ideas forward to us uh, on a permit. Um, and, but I wanna bounce this idea of a permit against uh, Selectman Bonza's comments from a previous week in that uh, would these be giving the impression to a resident we're guaranteeing a space because they paid for it. And then the answer to that from what you said is, is no, we're not guaranteeing a space. And at that point we have- A resident wouldn't pay for it. No, a non-resident who pays $50 or whatever it is for the cost for a year is gonna say, I paid $50 and I can't park here. So I want my money back. There's, um, it's, it's I, a, there's, there's uh, I'm, I'm hesitant on that point <coughs> about how we're guaranteeing spaces. I. You know, in that regard, but I think a step in the right direction. No, is yeah, and that's I think that's that's one of the problems, Nick, is that when you do look at one of these yearly pass things, um, and there's sufficient, know, there's and, and, there's, and there's sufficient parking. I, I agree with you, but in in a very limited situation, if we're going to go down the revenue path, then I think the kiosk or some sort of system where they would pay per hour or something or per day on a first come first serve basis would be the way to gen generate the revenue. I think you'll have more headaches here because potentially if, if, if 50 or 100 people buy that pass and now they're all competing for 18 spaces, they're gonna be coming down here, sucking up our time, going to PD, parking illegally, and but I paid $50, give me my money back. Um, I think it's more problematic. And there is, there is a cost for this. It's the issuing cost. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the least expensive of all the options. Yeah, the payback for the rate of return on your investment for a, a kiosk is and I'm not, decades. And I just want to be clear here. I'm not against what your proposal. And Steve, believe it or not, I'm not against yours either. But I think this is a progression. And I think the first part is ramped up enforcement to see how that goes. And if that does not work, then we start to go to plan B. And if plan B doesn't work, then we go to plan C. But what does that mean? I'd like a time. definition of ramped up enforcement. I'll speak to that. We will be having directed patrols, at least two per shift walkthroughs on the beach, on hot sunny days where it is packed. On a regular Monday morning, I won't have anyone walking down there. In addition to that, I will have an officer in plain clothes on the beach on occasion. It has been posted as such that they'll be patrolling in both uniform and plain clothes capacity. These officers will rotate between Glen Lake Beach and Mountain Base. Um, at that point, they will call in any violators of littering, alcohol, or any other violations of the ordinance or state law to m uniformed officers to give them a summons. So that's the ramped up enforcement along with the usual parking that we do here. End of, end of discussion. One question. Yes, One question. Um, the public works is asking whether or not to take the lids <coughs> off the trash cans so that people can access that. It is a carry in, carry out, but remember it didn't work and after two weeks into that program they put the trash containers on the edge of the road. They haven't taken off the plywood on top of those containers and they're wondering if they should be doing that because they've been watching your discussion. Well, the only other comment to that was Carl wrote that people from go through town and drop their trash off when it's at the road. And yep. And that's we do it here at Town Hall. And I that's my 
that's my point from the well, previous discussion is to move the barrels closer to the beach area and less accessible to the sidewalk or walk well, I think area. Carl's email says that he doesn't have the resources to to then send somebody to move the the trash from that beach area to the street for pickup this this is then maybe, maybe he has to make the resources for it make the resources or uh, because the trucks are passing there yeah. every day, yeah. even though you know it's not once a week situation, they are passing there every day and uh, pull over, pull over. And, yep. You know, he it is what it is. I mean, I think told, if the chief, if the chief is going to be doing that, or you know, a truck may visit a thousand houses in a day. He, he can't afford to get out of the truck and correct the barrel, pull it closer. Um, Examine barrels. He, he moves on pretty quickly, and so uh, yes, we'd be putting a crimp in that driver style, unless the park department uh, was able to uh, pull the barrels closer to the street, just like we do in our houses. We also have the adopt a spot program. I mean, someone came in a couple weeks ago when we were touring yeah. over to the DPW <coughs> with the adopt a spot. I mean, maybe yeah. they could help out with that. I'm just, I mean, there, there are other options. I mean, and I wasn't joking about, you know, licensing or giving someone the opportunity to have a little business there because that would also give someone the potential of, it's a presence. I mean, if you have a couple of canoes or, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, that's, and that's something that makes it more of a destination too. So I, there's, there's different ways of, of skinning the cap, but I think my personal opinion is, is that try the, the increased uh, police presence try the uh, enhanced garbage collection. If that doesn't work, then we go on to your plan. If yours doesn't work, then we go on to Steve's plan. I mean, but at least it's, it's, it's a slower progression. And I know what you're gonna say is that, oh, this thing's been going on for years, and I, and I understand that, but it's gotten a lot of attention the last couple of months, and I think we try to see what happens this summer, and then we're gonna be talking. If it doesn't work, then we will be talking about Permits and do no doggies, and then maybe not, you know, only residents. I mean, but I think you got to try the different approaches first, and you know, just to, to leap forward and say we're going to shut it off to, to no other residents without trying this approach first, Nick's, sec Nick's approach second. I don't know. I don't, I don't think there's a harm just in doing just that. Just so you, I understand we're done, but just so you understand, my my concern is the idea that by making it a town beach, it's, it's not it's not about I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a cleanliness factor that we need to deal with also, but it's still a separate issue. Access is access. It has nothing to do with, an, you know, with the other with the other piece that you're speaking about. It. Well, see, I it, don't know. I don't know what all I'm trying to say is like, good, uh, I, I appreciate, and we appreciate the effort, you know, that, that you're going to put forth here. The chief says, hey, we're going to enforce it, keep it clean, keep the alcohol off. I mean, that's a fantastic piece. I'm sure it's been done in the decades behind also, but it will not change the access to the beach. It will not change that. And so as much as we talk about this, and I know we're going to move forward from here after this, it will not change town access, citizen access to that beach. It won't change it. It will be still 18 spots shared with, with, uh, with anyone else. I, I think word of mouth on increased patrols may influence that situation on. You know, that was, yeah, I'm sorry. <coughs> with all the parking at the school still, it's not restricted. People have unlimited access to park at that school. There's no restriction on keeping anyone from parking at that school. So we're not talking just 18 yeah. parking spaces. We're talking probably right. 36. It's 25. Thir 25 right. Primary, school. and then there's the eight on the side. Right. That's where, like, I didn't. I, I just don't know if you go back, whether it be that, you know, the, the, you know when we read the history <laughs> of it, or just even the most recent citizen proposal and all the gyrations in the last couple of weeks, and, and you know, is it access? I mean, to me, it was access. It was giving citizens the opportunity to have some of those spots kind of reserved for Goffstown residents. But then you hear from some others, no, let's shut this thing down. Well, to me, then what's the motivation to that one? We just don't want outsiders here. That's how it comes off. Three. I don't want outsiders. I don't want outsiders on my beach. They're welfare people. When that, that, that's what it sounds like. First of all, for me, just you need that's to. It's not you saying. You, it. I know that, but you need to just take a step oh, back from that one. Chairman Scott yeah. Rose. Okay, and I mean, you're, you're trying <laughs> to bring a, a, a hot issue to it, and it doesn't belong in the issue. 
period, okay? Second thing is that when I look at the older pieces of this, when this place was built, and according to Carlos Adams, when they designed it, the reason there was 18 slots was that this beach can't afford to handle 100 people, mm -hmm. okay? And so all of a sudden we talk about access, and now all of a sudden we're taking parking space that was not intended use for this pl for, the, for the beachfront because it it's not the reason there was 18 parking spaces was because it cannot hold accommodate more than that more than right. that. So what you're saying now is that hey, by the way, we will use the school parking which will give greater access, which I do agree, but you have a beach that <coughs> cannot accommodate that size. And that was the whole design of the last piece when previous boards, I imagine you would have been on it, Phil, uh, uh, approved that plan. Was oh, absolutely, but uh, don't forget, as I brought up the last meeting, and the chief is here, okay? How many people park on Upton Lane or other streets and walk down to the beach? Absolutely. And, and on the other side, how many people park at one lake and take their bikes off the car and go go riding. I myself have seen yeah. three or four oh vehicles yeah. pull up. They all take their bikes off and they're gone for or the day. How many or kayaks? Thank you. How many people go into a rowboat, a but kayak, or go out on a boat and spend the rest of the day? They're not really on the beach. They're on they're on the lake the whole day. Or they may go with a friend and they have the car, but they're the person is trailering the boat and they all go out in the boat for the. I mean, so it's. I, and I guess that's what I didn't understand. This whole thing is when I proposed <laughs> last week to say, okay, if half of it was for Gothtown and half of it was for, was for open, then it does give guarantee some access. But then there was, you know, well, why does that? That doesn't make any sense either. Well, if access is the issue, then it's a compromise. But if access is not the issue, then there's something else at play. And I don't know. Access is the issue, okay. For you. Yep. So we're going forward with the Chiefs. Right, I, but, I, but I also think that we should be taking a look at the time frame and how much time are we going to give this? Let's ask him. What is the time? measure of our success? I mean, what are we shooting for? You know, obviously we're shooting for a cleaner beach. We're shooting for a, a place that is more conducive to what families. Okay, is that safe to say? So you have to know what are you looking to measure during this whole period of time. So we're looking for a cleaner facility. A uh, place that is more conducive to <coughs> families. What else? Nick brought up uh, pets, I believe, correct? Nothing that we can't do anything about. There's not any order to stop. Alcohol free. I think increase people's responsibility right. when they're using right. these facilities. And uh, and how do you and how are we going to measure that? Again, that's going to be through the educational portion. Is there a way to measure it? No, there's not a definitive way to measure it. Um, you're going to have hopefully less trash. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I'm, I'm in total support of increased enforcement as long as we know that, that at the end of the day we can somehow measure it and that, or at least get a sense that it's working. And then what time frame are we going to say? Are we going to say by, the, by uh, July? July? Fourth, fourth of July weekend, the end of that weekend. That's our experimental time and then we... Well, because no, I'm not going to put a de definite that's no, when I we end our part. thing. We will continue our enforcement, but that's the time frame that I'm going to give it from Memorial Day to the 4th of July okay. and as the high, high intensity enforcement. Right, and I think from there, then I'd like to take a step back personally and say, okay, did this work or didn't it work? And if it didn't work, then I'm going to plan B. And then I'd like to try that for the rest of the summer. And if that doesn't work, then I might go to plan C personally. But I, I would suggest that we turn to some of the very people that came to us with proposals to see if they would be willing to put a small group of people together to monitor the beach or beach areas um, over a period of time and then report back to us. Fine. Have they seen an improvement? They're the ones who came to us with the problem. So they know what to look for. They know when those problem times are and um, they would be the best to tell us if there has been an improvement or any change. flip side of it is, is, is more of the uh, someone who's an independent person who's taking an objective look at it also another opportunity there because obviously the, the writers of that initial report wanted it to go in a certain direction the, the gentleman who came in here earlier guy Karen he sees it as a certain way and you know sometimes there's a tendency to 
plant something, it, you know, you just you see it under in certain glass. They all articulated pretty much the same issue. Right, and I think they articulated it well, but I, I guess it, if you're looking for an independent analysis, is you know what does it look like now, and what does it look like you know, and the fourth of you know by the fourth of July, um, if I if I have it in my mind that I'm looking to restrict this to only Goffstown residents, then no matter what he does, that's what it might come out. And I don't know. I'm just I'd rather have somebody who's more independent. Uh, make if you're going to have someone trying to you know characterize it. Lot of thoughts on that. That's what I was thinking. Might be a better idea. Yeah. Have a little bit more independent, I think. All right, so we're going to proceed with increased enforcement uh, up until around, say, July 4th. We'll then um, ask for input from the residents as well as Parks and Recreation as to how this thing has worked out. Um, and then we'll revisit it, you know, in July. I think we also need some input from Public Works as far as the trash, the trash. collection, right. how that's working. Right. Uh, so we have a kind of a handle working with the chief and Public Works as far as where they go, because what what I would hate to see is uh, police officers making a suggestion, let's say, that the trash be one place and they not be there because somebody over here says that, you know, right. I'd like to make sure that everything's kind of coordinated. The point being is that like, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, then I think we need to take a look next we'll plan because a, we'll then the reality it of it is, is that it is a trash issue or we need a monitor there and then how do we pay for it and that's a viable way of paying for it, whether it be permits or kiosks or whatever. I agree with yeah. everything that's been discussed here in the last five minutes. Uh, and you, you bring up the effort of the uh, input from DPW on the, the uh, their perception of increased workload because of trash collection, which then answers Sue's question from earlier this evening. Let's get the lids off the trash cans now and the trash cans active. Keep six families were there today and two boaters to get the cans locked. They need to start it now and not wait till Memorial Day. Is it a violation for a, a non-resident to put trash into didn't you want to non resident trash? No, no, no. Oh. Someone you mean household on their way trash? household. They're oh. on their way to work. Oh. They pull over and they because I think that was one of the things we heard from the I don't director. I, I'm not sure there's a law that says that if you're not disposing of it properly that it's littering or improper disposal. There may be something under, you know, waste or something like that. Right. <coughs> so we'll pen this for uh, the second week of July, first or second week of July. And if there's anything that we need to do with regard to background work, then let's do it so we can hit the ground running in July. Next is um, thank you, Chief. Thank you, thank you thank Chief. You, Selectman's Chief. discussion. Any new business? <coughs> Old business. I attended a uh, PDQ meeting on Friday, as I mentioned earlier. What? PDQ. PDQ. Planning and Environmental Quality. I said PDQ. PDQ. Okay. okay. Um, and during that, uh, you know, towards the end of that, uh, our meeting for this Friday is actually being postponed because 8 o'clock in the morning is a hearing on the percentage of uh, for the wish pool, public IGT wish pool, IG reserves. Uh, and it was also brought up that Julia Griffin, the town, uh, town manager in Hanover, uh, was proposed to um, writing a letter to state reps and the senators, and I believe the maybe the governor also, I don't know, uh, about the issue. Um, I uh, I put my name on a list to sign the letter, and I told them that I'd let them I'd bring it back to the board, um, you know, update the board, and uh, hopefully get a consensus with the board. Um, what is trying to be done is to, you know, the, the first of all, um, the letter that Sue drafted on behalf of the board was read by uh, Representative Heichel, 
a public hearing. And I subsequently have seen Representative Heichel, and I, I thank him um, for it. And he commented to me that after he read it, he said he couldn't believe how many people came up to him and thanked him uh, for, for his comments and leaving that there. Um, what they're trying to do, what, where this is going, is to put the public risk pool under the Secretary of State. Uh, at the PEQ meeting, what was brought up and was <coughs> prompting this letter from Julia Griffin is that they've done some research, uh, there's been some research that was done, and in the United States, I think, believe the number was 47, there are 47 public risk pools in the United States, government you know, public risk pools. Out of the 47, 23 of them are regulated all 23 in different states and all 23 that are regulated <coughs> come under the insurance department yeah. department in their states not one of them comes under the secretary of state that are regulated and this letter is to uh, try to bring out this point that the risk pools should be regulated by the insurance Commission, not come under the Secretary of State, and I, um, I put my name on a list that I would, s that I would sign this letter. Since then, um, I received an e email today. I don't know if Sue got a copy of it. Mm -hmm. um, she, if she has it up, she can read it to you. But my PEQ meeting has been postponed to after the public hearing, and I was asked that anybody who could make the eight o'clock in Concord that wanted to testify, uh, that please do. Um, and if, it, if I can make it and I do go and testify, I would just like to be able to say that I'm there on behalf of the board. Uh, one of the things that um, <coughs> I think is important is that I serve with uh, Representative and Selectman uh, Bob Wheeler. Well, he, he was on the risk pool for uh, health trust I was on the property liability uh, trust. And we both had the same, uh, you know, actuary, not the same actuaries, but with the same processes of how we came up with reserves, uh, which was all by uh, standards of the insurance industry. Um, so I, I think that that's, uh, and I think that whether you, you like Bob Wheeler or you hated Bob Wheeler, one thing that I have to say about Bob is Bob would never allow some agency to retain and keep excess money from towns and cities in New Hampshire. That's something that he would not allow. He, he, would, he's not, he would never be for that. So I think um, if it's okay with the board that uh, when I do go, that I would be able to speak on behalf of the board. Is the, is the board okay with that? Okay, the board is fine. Okay, great. Thank you. I just wanted to update you. Um, Representative Kurt, you remember you asked yeah. me to make sure everyone okay. supported his proposed amendment to have it fall under the insurance First department department. rather than Secretary mm -hmm. of State's office. He wrote today saying, um, Hi, Sue, my proposal was turned down by the House Finance Democrats and did not make it into the final version of the bill. On the other hand, the committee rejected an amendment that would have capped reserves and put the pooled health trust under the regulation of the Corporate Securities Bureau. So the House has no formal position on this issue. Some in the House leadership do support the failed amendment. I'm told the Senate amended their bill on this issue, eliminating any specific percentage for reserves, instead allowing it to be set by the Corporate Securities Bureau after an actuarial report. Should that position emerge in a self-contained bill or in a new version of the budget bill, I will again try to have the pool health trust regulated by the insurance department, but it may be an uphill battle. Regards, Neil. Corporate Security Bureau, isn't that under investigation now for the mortgage fraud? The corporate what? Security yeah. division? Okay. Corporate securities? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's whether you file your LLCs or not. 
because that's all part of the corporate division now. So I don't know where the break. I don't know how the structure is broken mm -hmm. out under the corporate division. I'm gonna keep moving. Uh, committee reports. Sewer. Yes, the uh, sewer commission did meet on the 11th of May, and uh, they had four uh, aspects of, of significance. Uh, they approved a contract which would provide a final design of the project intended to stabilize a portion of the uh, ground where the sewer line runs under the rail trail east of Moose Club Park Road. It's near Namaski Lake. The problem in that area is that due to the steep slope between the rail trail and the shoreline, uh, the ground appears to be sliding towards the lake. And uh, hence, there's a risk of a sewer line failure. Um, the slope stabilization project uh, through through that project, the town will be taking remedial action to reduce the risk of such an event. Um, they discussed the Mass Road sewer line replacement and uh, the contractor there plans to start construction on Monday, the May 24th. And the initial work will be towards the eastern end of the project, uh, and I would say Rockland Street, near the you know, intersection of Mass and Rockland. Uh, the final details on uh, traffic controls are still being worked out. And just as a reminder, the entire project is in several phases extending over two summer seasons. The third item, um, in April, reminder letters were sent to 119 SOAR customers whose uh, payments were overdue. This is about 6% of all SOAR accounts. Now the good news is that uh, those letters resulted in about one half of the property owners immediately paying what was due. Um, and from my own observations, um, the account in arrears, I said 6%, is not an unusually high number at this point in the year compared to previous years. The status of uh, accounts in arrears only becomes more serious when the, the fiscal year is ending and uh, uh, such accounts face the prospects of a tax lien Finally, uh, the SOAR Commission discussed the Abington Square townhomes. Uh, they are in the final efforts of uh, trying to achieve certificates of occupancy by late June. Uh, there was one SOAR issue, and uh, that was uh, took a while to resolve, and I, I think according to minutes of the discussion that was resolved. And so there's other uh, construction issues leading to the certificate of occupancy, and it might be uh, one of the five buildings ready by June. And that was it. Sure. Question. Sue, so didn't, did we receive FEMA funding for the repair of the sewer, the sewer line, the uh, sloughing? Hazard yes. Mitigation, yes. Yes, it will be. Uh, it's covered by that? Yes. Thank oh, you. this part too? No, the, uh, the slope stabilization project is uh, so federal. Aside from slough off oh. into the FEMA? river? I yeah, it's believe it's so. It's through okay. FEMA, hazard mitigation through FEMA. Okay. And that's and uh, so this uh, just the uh, just the final design was on the order of uh, thirty-eight thousand dollars just to do the design of what we want the contractor to do. To keep this close to the slide. Yes, Steve. Mm -hmm. You know, originally uh, we had. You do not want to think about the Masky Lake <laughs> in such an event. Well, I know exactly where the block cut is. <laughs> Orange Farm. Above Orange Farm. Uh, originally, one of the uh, engineered the studies for the slope, slope slate stabilization included a stainless steel wire mesh that was supposed to be put on there to hold it in. And for some reason or other, it didn't get approved by the state. I don't know why. Planning board. <laughs> You're looking at him saying planning board. Oh, well, no twice. <laughs> <laughs> planning board did meet uh, last uh, Thursday, and th there was a time extension request um, for uh, <coughs> site plan to build a four-unit multifamily uh, building um, over uh, Laurel uh, next to the old uh, landfill uh, in that area. Uh, which was granted per a year. Uh, there was also a uh, uh, 
uh, final sub uh, review hearing for a lot consolidation and three lot subdivision uh, by the Lolly Revocable Trust, which was approved with conditions. Uh, also, we had a uh, uh, request for uh, extension on the. Um <coughs> It was the Fournier Revocable Trust um, over on Patty Hole Road, which was granted to, I believe it was June 24th, the second reading. Any questions? Any questions? I, I had a couple of things under, I don't know if it's old business or new business, but we were getting into the habit of having our department heads come in to talk, give us kind of a report. And we kind of fell off the bandwagon there. And we're going to get back in, uh, back on the wagon. Sure, I've been putting your reports on your folder in your, on no, your verbally computer. They, but you said right. you want them coming in for, you were doing it quarterly. Do you want quarterly? Yeah, and I, and I think um, we have not I think I've seen our police and fire. We, I, I think maybe Rick, I don't see how things are going, and mm -hmm. um, so we're just trying to get back onto that. You know, and I think with an emphasis on budget, you know, how is the budget coming along, and any other old or new business? We okay. Um, two, sm uh, one small thing, and one not so small. One. Um, there was an area on the Manistee Lake that we was trying to get a uh, get an eagle scout to clean up the bay stone. <coughs> I hear so much stuff. That's, that's okay. Water under bridge. <laughs> but I just want to check with the board because other people have had interest. They said, "What if?" Because there's there's steel barrels, there's steel there's tires, there's a wheelbarrow, and local people in the community just said, "Do you mind if you, they they're saying if they just go down there and clean it out themselves?" Do we have a problem with that, or do we have to go through a process? In fact, quite frankly, I think the town should actually go down and pick out the steel barrels, the tires, and the, the old water wheelbarrows, but the local residents are ready to do it. Do we have a problem? Where is it on? Where is it? The town, it's town on lane. Bay Street, right? Down, down Bay Street, yeah, right. Uh, I, I have no problem, but you do face the same predicament that I do on the rail trail uh, when I pull into the transfer station with a load of uh, trash from town yeah. property is convincing the attendant that this was town trash. I'll touch I'll touch base with Carl first when we come up with a load, but if we don't have a problem with That's it. what I do. I, okay. I give them a day's notice down there. Right. Yeah. Do you, is this group of residents interested in doing the drop the spot on a regular basis? I think they're just saying, I think it's more of a thing of they just get together for a Saturday and just say we would, we'll, we'll help pick it up and just clean it up. That's all. But I mean, there's been 55 gallon drums that are rusting down there. Before. Could, could uh, you stop by the Glen Lake waterfront? <laughs> No pick drinking. Up some trash there. No drinking. Right. <laughs> now here's the, the second one though, and the second one is is that I, I want to deal with it more on next Monday. But by the time we you know we call in, everyone gets to think it's Friday. Doesn't give much time for research. But the, the question has come up several times regarding the trestle. Where's the trails is going across? But the rea um, but there's still the question of what that what that bridge is going to look like. And during the last co couple floods, it that has become the primary dam for the lake. And what we're dealing here with is, at one point I've heard people say, well, maybe they'll remove the, the, sta the, the, the stands, maybe they'll remove two of them, but we don't know that answer. And I, and I think this is a time for us to look at it and say, where do we, what, um, you know, what is going to happen with it and how do we go forward? Because um, the state, uh, during the Mother's Day flood, they researched and they looked at it. And for those, uh, I don't know if anyone went up to Concord, they actually brought federal people in and they looked at what happened during the flood of the Mother's Day. You know, what, what, what were some of the things that ha happened during the Mother's Day flood? And one of them was the idea of how they opened and controlled the dams. And the second piece was that came up and it was the trestle. And that's <coughs> the primary dam. And so exactly, that's the primary dam. And since then, floods have, you know, in fact, the newspaper put in there once floods have set, they've become a way of life down there. And you're dealing with public safety, and you're dealing with private. You know, with, you're dealing with property values. And it's not not just the idea of property values, but you know, property itself. And so the question here is that they're doing a great job monitoring it, they're doing it regarding working the dance, but we still run up with debris in the in the trestle. In fact, we had Mr. Pierce went down the last time during the flood itself, and had you know we had to have it removed. The Mother's Day flood, there was no debris there at the time before the flood, but it came down during the flood. In other words, there was no way you could have stopped it. So 
Um, I'm not sure if this is something that we want as a board that we, we get, uh, do we contact Jim Gallagher from, from, from the state? Do we contact Lou D'Alessandro? Do we do a letter, letter to, the, to the governor? But I'd like to discuss this on Monday. What we can do, because I think this is a situation where if they're gonna be doing the bridge, it, this could be a win-win for everybody at this point in time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I can confirm with you, but my understanding is the rail trail grant is to replace the deck on that trestle. Mm -hmm. There is no structural work being done to the trestle itself. And like I say, then, then at that point, I think it would be for us <coughs> as, as, as a board of the town that our first thing, one is public safety. During the floods, we've had we've had uh, search teams go down there. We've had people evacuated, and we've also we've had damaged personal property. If we're going to do anything for our community, this is one of the first things we should be handling: is safety in in, in, in our property. And part of the reality is that if that's the case, what they're doing with the bridge is totally separate. We should still proceed forward, saying we need to, you know, because uh, the plan was brought forward by the state. They brought the federal flood bureaus in when I went up to Concord, and they researched this. And they came back and they said that trestle, no thing, that blockage created the primary dam, and that was one of the issues they were going to address. And it hasn't been addressed because, like everything else, it dropped off. Yeah. I think it's a jurisdiction issue as well. Yeah. Well, do we want to? I, uh, I, I've got to chip in here because I don't respectfully disagree with some of your your assessment. Um, Mother's Day flood. My point of view, Mother Nature flushed downstream 50 years worth of accumulation that hadn't been seen. And that was why it was a serious backup. So uh, if 95% of the accumulated trash over 50 years has been flushed downstream by, by Mother Nature, the future won't be as bad. Um, I think the only it's a, it is a, a jurisdictional, and I I, I would be opposed to, uh, to to somehow think that Manchester is going to redesign a clear span bridge. Well, and here's where I, here, here's the place where I don't know where we're going. First of all, that debris that came down, that debris came down on the last flood and the flood after that. This is this is a recurring event. Right, and I think like the, and the, the, the other point I would make is that if you look at the windstorms that we've had lately. It knocks trees down so that before you didn't have anything. Now, if, it, if we had another major flood event, you may have if additional debris. If I could finish, and if you want to take a walk, go down <laughs> behind the women's prison. You can see where, and that's, that's county land, and you'll see two massive trees, which will go on the next one. The, 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 the whole bank is washed out. It's now in the water, you know, from the last flood. But the reality is, you know, when we talk about jurisdiction, I don't know who, who, what the jurisdiction is with that. I, you know, being, I don't think it's Manchester to tell you the truth, but I don't know the answer to that. In other words, flood management is a state-run issue, if, I, if I'm correct with that. And the state should be monitoring this. And we as a town, as a board, should be looking at it saying, wait a minute, was it a, was it a one-year time, 100-year flood? No, it's become a way of life. It's every year, and sometimes we've had two of them that were rather large this, this year. And I, I don't think we should sit back and just look at this. Uh, and and uh, I have a recommendation along the lines you're, you're speaking of, uh, perhaps this fall. Uh, our town can send letters to all of the abutters on the lake, including the county, saying um, help the community by removing from the shorefront uh, debris. debris, you know, complete trees especially. You know, while the four-foot logs are going to go through the trestle, no problem, but it's the complete trees. Remove them now rather than wait for Mother Nature to clog up the trestle. And, you know, this is a simple letter, and... It shows that uh, if you, as a neighbor, see debris on your neighbor's lawn, and then that debris is gone in a flood, well, you know who's parting, who's trying to help that flood situation. When we asked DES during the flood, they said to leave the trees in the water. Yeah. They said it was a natural habitat for. You can leave the roots. Do you, do you have to leave the tree? But, no. But That's what they said. Like I said, you know, just think, no, and if you look at the Mother's Day photos, there's docks in there, there's boats, boats in there. I mean, it's not just this debris, it's they just, get hung up on the trees. They, you know, <laughs> I mean, you would see whole 25 foot boats going down the river with the docks, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying, 
I, I would, well, if you I would like to, to bring it to the topic on between Monday. Between now and then, we can bring it up. But if you could get more information with regard to. I will send, I'll, I'll try and get the link on the reports okay. that were done by the state and by the federal dam. Okay. Federal flood. They came out of Tennessee and they looked at, and they, and they had put that trestle as, 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 as a major contributor. All right. Any other business? Motion to adjourn. Do we have any, no, we don't have any non public, no. right? We have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Seconded by Buckman Camposano. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero.